Welcome to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson. I'm the manager of public programs and outreach here at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome back to many of you who have joined us before for previous programs. This virtual series usually features programs on Pennsylvania transit history topics, uh, but also stories of the trolley era, um, our collection, things that you can experience from home, usually once or twice a month on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. So we're gonna continue these programs regularly as long as we have presenters. So um, if you have a show that fits the museum mission, please reach out, um, anything Pennsylvania, trolley era, cities where our streetcars come from, um, anything like that. And reach out anyway if, if your program doesn't quite fit those guidelines. Um, and you can see a full list of upcoming presentations on our website at patrolley.org. And I'll share that in the chat box in just a minute so you can click on those. We don't have any other registrations available just yet, but you can see the list of programs coming up. And I want to extend a very special thank you to those of you who donated while registering for tonight's program, or if you've made donations through our website this year. We really, really appreciate your virtual um, or your support of our virtual outreach programs. Um, so some of you may be new to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. We were established in 1954 as the Arden Electric Railway by a group of trolley enthusiasts called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club. And we opened to the public just a few years later in 1963. And we're located along the former interurban route between Pittsburgh and Washington, Pennsylvania. We've got uh, over 50 trolleys now and electric railway cars, uh, about 20 of those operate. And last year we had over 30,000 visitors take the four mile scenic ride here at the museum. Um, and if you missed it, we just opened a brand new building November 10th to the public. So um, if you haven't been to the museum in a while, it has changed and we're super excited to share it with you. Um, in fact, we have a lot of interesting events coming up and we're open through the winter for the first time this year, which has been going really, really well. There was only one day where there was too much snow to open. So uh, chances are you'll get to ride a trolley year round now. Um, I mentioned some spring events here. April 27th, we have our Members Day and Volunteer Appreciation Dinner, May 4th and 5th. This will be the first time uh, we're doing Vintage Communications Weekend. So that'll be everything from typewriters to the local ham radio club to um, a Victrola. And what else do we have? Uh, vintage radios and a printing press. So should be a lot of fun. Come on out for that. May 16th is our big fundraiser, the new Roaring Twenties Black Tie Gala. And then May 18th and 19th, we'll have a trolley era street fair with everything from stilt walkers and jugglers to magicians and um, let's see, fire dancers. So that should be a lot of fun as well. And a real big one for this crowd. Uh, and then I promise we'll get to Brian's presentation. <laughs> I just wanted to let everybody know actually before you before uh, we get to the end of the presentation about the West Penn Trolley Meet. Um, it is available for registration now at the website you see down there. I can put that in the chat as well. We're also um, selling fan trip tickets with um, PRT. So we're gonna basically get like the full rail fan tour of the system and um, it'll be a lot of fun. We're about a third a third of those tickets are sold already. So um, make sure you sign up for that if you are interested. patrolley.org slash West Penn Trolley Meet with dashes between the words. Okay, um, let me make sure. I think that is all I had for the start here. And now I would like to introduce today's presenter, Brian Doucette. Brian, uh, oh, I should say Dr. Brian Doucette. He's a planning professor at the University of Waterloo and one of Canada's leading experts in housing and cities. Much of his research focuses on patterns of change along new LRT corridors. He's the co-author of Streetcars and the Shifting Geographies of Toronto, a visual analysis of change. And he's been interested in transit his whole life and has photographed streetcars, trams, and trolleys for more than 25 years. Born and raised in Toronto, he's also lived in the Netherlands for 13 years, where he volunteered at the Electric Tram Museum in Amsterdam. He's a member of the Halton County Radial Railway, and he currently resides in Kitchener, Ontario. And uh, at the end of this presentation, we will have a question and answer session with Brian, but the chat box will be open throughout. So feel free to enter questions, comments during the show. We can get to those at the end. 
And just another note, this program is being recorded, so we'll be able to share it on YouTube at a later date. All right, at this time, if you are one of our viewers, if you could turn your video off, I'll invite you to turn those back on at the end. And I think we're ready to go, Brian, take it away. All right, thank you very much, Kristen, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it's great to be here virtually and, and great to have so many people from, from so many different places uh, joining us today. Um, I was thinking I've been down to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum twice, but the last time was in 2004. So I'm, I think, due for another visit. Um, and I was thinking, you know, what are some things that link, um, you know, the cities in Pennsylvania and, and Toronto, where I was born and raised? And, and one of them is streetcars and trolleys. Pittsburgh, Philadelphia and Toronto were one of the few cities in North America that retain streetcars for various reasons. And I'll tell you about Toronto's experience with keeping the streetcar ultimately. Um, in 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 a little bit um so i want to get started here with let get this up here there we are um and i was thinking too of well before we get into a few more similarities just a little bit more about myself so that picture there with the um the subway was about five houses from where i grew up so it was only logical that I would be interested in, you know, streetcars and subways and so on. Um, my father, Michael Doucette, who's in the audience today, uh, also had a, a lifelong or has a lifelong interest in streetcars, was on the opening day of, of Canada's first subway in 1954. And so you can see that transit um, has been a part of my life for, for, for a long time, sort of culminating in a way this sort of family um tradition with the book that I co-wrote with my father, uh, Streetcars and the Shifting Geographies of Toronto, which I'll, I'll speak more about a little bit later on. So thinking a little bit about Toronto's streetcars, um, there's a couple of things just to start off. And, and one was a, an ad that I saw recently when I was on the subway in Toronto that was talking about micro weddings. And there's a couple of things you can think about with this. Uh, you know, weddings are very expensive. Toronto is very expensive. So why not have a, a cheaper wedding, right? Invest in your marriage, not your wedding. But of course, you know, this is Toronto micro weddings and not Canada micro weddings because there's a streetcar in the background. So that kind of illustrates the importance of the streetcar as an icon of the city. And a lot's been written about Toronto streetcars over the years. I've written a lot. Many others have written a lot. But I think the wisest words go to my son, who was four years old at the time. And we were riding along the Dundas streetcar and it took a long time. And in fact, we were so delayed, we ended up missing our train back to Kitchener. And at some point he just turns to me in the with only the, the seriousness and, and earnestness that a four-year-old has. And, and he said, what happens if you take the streetcar and you want to get somewhere quickly? And I, I didn't have an answer to that because streetcars in Toronto, they carry a lot of people, but they are slow. And again, I'll, I'll explain more about that as we go through. So a little bit of where we are or where Toronto is. I'm, I'm 100 kilometers, 60 miles west of Toronto in Kitchener at the moment, but we're talking primarily about Toronto. So Toronto is situated on Lake Ontario. Uh, it's the capital and the largest city of the province of Ontario. Um, we are north of Buffalo um, and we are about a five hour drive from Pittsburgh. And Toronto is a city, but it's also surrounded by a large region, sometimes called the Greater Toronto Area and sometimes called the Greater Toronto and Hamilton Area because the city is growing and the region is growing and growing and encompassing places like Hamilton, which is at the very western end of Lake Ontario. So just to put things into context, and again, since this is, this is a Pennsylvania group, I thought I would sort of compare a few uh, Toronto and Pennsylvania things. So the city of Toronto has a population of about 2.8 million people, which is roughly the size of Chicago. It was amalgamated in the late 1990s to get to that amount and the pre-amalgamation city, which is roughly where the streetcars run and, and roughly the, the pre-World War II city has about 800,000 residents in it today. In fact, more people today than at any other time in its history. If we take that whole greater Toronto and Hamilton area, we get up to about 7.3 million, which is about the same size as greater Houston. And if we include all the way out to where I am here in Kitchener, if we include places like Niagara, what they call the greater golden horseshoe, we're getting upwards of 10 million people, which is around the same size as, as Chicago, uh, the whole Chicago metro, uh, metro area. 
Comparison, city of Pittsburgh, 300,000, which is about the same size as Vaughan, which is a, a suburb north of Toronto. The Pittsburgh region is about the same size as Metro Vancouver out on the West Coast. Uh, and for the Philadelphia folks, the city of Philadelphia is roughly the size of the city of Montreal, a little bit smaller. And Metro Philadelphia is about the same size as that greater Toronto area if you removed Hamilton from it. So a few more introduction things, um, getting around, you know, Canadian cities tend to have higher mode shares when it comes to transit than, than a lot of American cities. So uh, the TTC, which is the main public transit service in, in the city of Toronto, has almost a million weekday boardings. The commuter rail system has about a quarter of a million. Uh, Pearson Airport, which is the largest in Canada, has about 35 million um, uh, people per uh, per year. And the busiest highway in North America is not in Los Angeles, it's not in New York, it's not the I-76 in, in Philadelphia, which is Pennsylvania's biggest uh, or busiest, it's uh, Highway 401, which goes across the top of Toronto and has about 450,000 vehicles a day on its busiest stretches. Um, a lot of those people are moving around, they're getting further out of the city because it's where they can afford housing. Housing costs in Toronto are very expensive. Um, to buy an average detached house within the city of Toronto would cost you now about 1.25 million, about 920,000 American. And you can see that even if you're buying a condo apartment, it's still um, about half a million bucks US um, today. And if you're renting, you don't find many deals either. Rent is very expensive in this, uh, in this part of the world uh, and only getting more expensive. So I'm a big sports fan as well. So good to, you know, just get some sports comparisons. So the Toronto Maple Leafs, second most number of Stanley Cups um, in, in, uh, in, in NHL history behind Montreal, 13 of them. The last one won in 1967. And of course, your Pittsburgh Penguins have won five. Your Flyers have won two all since 1967. And most of us in Southern Ontario are not old enough to remember that 1967 Stanley Cup, myself included. Um, I have not known a successful Maple Leafs team uh, throughout my life. Baseball, well, a lot of success in Pennsylvania, of course. The Pirates have won five. The Phillies have won two. The Philadelphia Athletics have also won five, although I'm sure very few people would, would remember any of those today. And the Toronto Blue Jays won those back-to-back -back World Series in 1992 and 1993. And I'm sorry, I can't help bring up that home run by Joe Carter off Mitch Williams um, in that 1993 World Series, uh, which is the greatest moment in uh, in Blue Jays history. All right, let's turn our attention to to transit, and we're going to talk a little bit about the history of of Toronto transit. Um, this just gives you an overview of the contemporary map, but we'll get into kind of the history. But before we do, I I show a lot of pictures. I tend not to talk about each one, but I tend to show a lot of pictures. So there's a lot of images in this presentation, um, and I hope you enjoy them. And a lot of them come from the collection, either the personal photographs or the wider collection of the late John F. Bromley, who many of you are probably familiar with. He took photos all across uh, Europe for, for many years, Toronto, Pittsburgh in the 1960s, and um, he passed away in 2019. Um, and I, I have to thank his wife, Margaret Bromley, his widow, who is in the, I believe, in the virtual audience today, um, for giving me access to these photos not just for things like this, but we're now working on a, a, a new book project that will take some of his his most important images and um, and show them to to a wider audience. So we're we're working on that, and we hope to be able to announce some things about that very very soon. A lot of the more modern pictures were taken by most of them were taken by me, and um, as Kristen said, I've been taking photos of, of streetcars for more than twenty five years, and. Um, I've noticed my photography has changed over that time, especially in the last five or 10 years, where I'm focusing less on the streetcar as the central object and trying to photograph every vehicle or every different location, and really trying to tell more of a story about this relationship between the streetcars and the places they run through. And so you, you may notice this kind of change in my own photography as we go sort of forward in time towards the end of the presentation where I'm thinking a little bit more about not just the vehicle, but how it fits within the wider city. Quick request, uh, if you could move your mouse, Brian. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. All right. Do you see my screen with the, the participants and all that, or do you just see the mouse? No, I, I it was just the mouse, and now it's okay. off to the side. We're the mouse good. is gone. Sorry about that. 
All right, so I want to talk about the the history of Toronto streetcars. Um, trying to move that out of the way. I get this banner that I kind of want to go away. There we are. Um, so, and I'm going to include a series of maps that were all made by uh, my friend, Sean Marshall, who is also in the virtual audience today. And there's a QR code there you can scan to access his fabulous website, which has all these detailed maps throughout Toronto's history. So the first um, transit route in Toronto uh, opened in 1849, and it was an omnibus line, and it ran from um, the St. Lawrence Market up to Yorkville, a distance of a couple of miles. But in 1861, the city granted a 30-year charter to the Toronto Street Railway to build and operate horse car lines in the city. Canada's first um, street railway opened in, on September 11th, 1861. This was also when the TTC or the, the Toronto track gauge of four foot 10 and seven eighths was established. So like Pennsylvania trolleys, there's a, a distinct track gauge separate from the standard gauge of four foot eight and a half. The system expanded in this 30 years as the city grew and the city was growing quite, quite rapidly at this time, um, especially after 1867 when Canada becomes a country and Toronto becomes the capital of the province of Ontario and quite quickly becomes the most important city in, in English-speaking Canada. Still second place to Montreal, uh, but a, an important part, a, important city here in, in Ontario. The Toronto Street Railway's franchise expired in uh, 1891. The city briefly took over operations before passing assets to uh, a new company called the Toronto Railway Company. And the Toronto Railway Company was given a 30-year franchise uh, lasting until 1921, and a key requirement was that it would electrify the network within three years, which it did. It started converting horse cars to electricity in 1892, and the last horse car line ran in 1894. Now, the city grew quite rapidly during this period, largely through annexing neighboring communities, and that's important to, to understand what happened with this Toronto Railway Company. Gives you a few impressions of, of the city at this time. In 1915, um, the side running boards on open cars were banned. And so up until that point, the city had a large fleet of open cars for the summer, as many cities did. But after 1915, they were, um, they were prohibited in the city. The Toronto Railway Company was not only the operator of streetcars, they built pretty much all of the of their fleet in their own shops. And most of them were fairly basic wood bodied um, streetcars dating from the first 10, 15 years of the 20th century. So as I mentioned, the city was growing very rapidly at this time. By 1920, the population was half a million. And all of these sort of pink areas that you see in, on the map were areas that the city had annexed after 1891. Now, there was some different interpretations about that original 1891 Toronto Railway Company charter. The TRC interpreted it as they were to provide streetcar service in the within the boundaries set out in that charter. The city countered and said, well, the city is growing. You should provide streetcar service all across the growing city. The TRC refused. And so you had this situation where a number of different companies were providing service to connect with separate fares um, with, with very disjointed networks. One of them was the Toronto Civic Railway, which um, was a municipally run street railway company that operated in a lot of those annexed areas. And so they had three or four different routes completely separate from each other. This is one here at St. Clair. And actually, if you wanted to transfer from here to go all the way downtown, you would have to take three different streetcars. You take the Toronto Civic Railway here, you take another um, interurban or radial line part of the way down Young Street to get to the old city boundaries, and then you would transfer to the Toronto Railway Company. So obviously not a very efficient system or not a very good system for uh, encouraging growth and encouraging uh, transportation. So the city had a referendum in 1920 
about whether or not the streetcar system should be municipalized and, and brought under one common public ownership. The citizens of Toronto voted overwhelmingly to uh, to adopt this. And so when the Toronto Railway Company franchise expired in September of 1921, the Toronto Transportation Commission was formed as a public entity um, operated and owned by the, the City of Toronto. So the TTC in 1921 took over 142 miles of track from the Toronto Railway Company, 22 from the Civic Railway, and nine from the Toronto and York Radio Railway, which ran a couple of radial, what we call in Canada, radio lines, which you'd call interurban lines. By the end of 1922, the TTC added 57 more miles and reached its peak in 1928, 1929. One of the things, that, first things the TTC did was order new streetcars. And they ordered these um, Peter Witts, which again are very common in, in you know, this part of North America. They ordered a total of 350 motored uh, uh, cars and, and 225 trailers manufactured by Canadian Car and Foundry, Brill, and the Ottawa Car Company. This meant that there was a surplus of some of these older Toronto Railway Company streetcars. Some of them survived for, for a number of decades, but a lot of the, the single truck, two axle cars were quickly retired. One of the major things that the TTC did in the first few years of its existence was actually rebuild pretty much the entire streetcar network because the original Toronto Railway Company streetcars were much narrower than the Peter Witts. And so the whole the the whole system had to be rebuilt to have more space between the two sets of rails, right? The the devil strip, the the space, not not the track gauge, but the space between the two um, sets of rails. And so the whole system in the first few years of the 1920s was completely rebuilt to allow for the wider Peter Witt streetcars to be running. Um, and you can notice here the wider width between the tracks here in a, a you know a typical downtown scene compared to some of those earlier views we start to see more um, more automobiles but busy congested um, downtowns the streetcars would also take people down to the the island ferry docks so you could go for a, a day on the islands to to relax and go to the beach and the streetcars would take you right to the ferry as they still do today actually although it looks a little bit different from from this So again, Toronto became, by the 1920s, the most important city in English Canada, uh, the second city of, of the country behind Montreal, and we start to see some of that more bigger development. We've got the Union Station, which is still Canada's busiest railway station on the right, and the Royal York Hotel, one of the, the famous uh, Canadian Pacific hotels on the left. Now, like everywhere, the Depression took its toll. The Depression killed off most of the interurban lines, that the radio lines that radiated out from Toronto, um, and ridership took a hit. So the TTC was one of the founding members of the Electric Railway President's Conference Committee, and in 1938, placed their first order for new PCC streetcars. They placed the biggest single order for an air electric car, 140 in the first order, and um, would eventually get a fleet of 744 PCCs, including 540 new PCCs and a number of secondhand ones, which I'll talk about in a moment. There were five orders of air electric cars uh, spread into the war years. So here's a few images. These are all post-war images, but gives you a few um, impressions of, of some of these early series of PCCs. This building in the background is now um, Scotiabank Arena, where the Raptors and the Leafs play. It was a postal sorting station just south of Union Station. Um, and now streetcars run under um, under this on a, a new streetcar subway that was opened about 35 years ago. After the war, the TTC also ordered 250 um, all-electric streetcars spread across three orders. Uh, the first two were 100 cars. Uh, the second of those, the 4400 series, they were equipped with multiple unit uh, couplers for MU operation, which they quite quickly uh, started operating on the, the Bloor Danforth route, the busiest, one of the busiest routes in the city. And in 1951, they placed one of the last orders for um, new PCCs an order of 50 from St. Louis Car Company. 
Now the PCCs in Canada or in Toronto, the body shells were made by St. Louis Car Company and the final assembly took place by Canadian Car and Foundry in Montreal. And that was to avoid import duties um, in an era well before free trade. Now these new streetcars coming in in the late 40s allowed for the retirement of um, the, the last of the Toronto Civic Railway cars. This line in particular was converted to a trolley bus. Um, but we saw a lot the first kind of abandonments and, and conversions away from streetcars at this time. The last double-ended streetcars running on the city routes ran on Spadina, which was a, is a busy north-south route just west of downtown, which has got streetcars back since 1997. Um, but the last double-ended uh, streetcars were, as I said, abandoned in 1948. The last radial line, which ran north of Toronto up to a, what is now a, a busy, bustling suburb, but was at that point a village called Richmond Hill, that was also abandoned in 1948. And in 1951, the last of the Toronto Railway Company wooden streetcars was taken out of service. One of one of these survives, or at least one of them survives in this form at the Halton County Radio Railway, number 1326, which was the one of the first two streetcars that the museum acquired, very similar to this one here in this picture. Now the TTC couldn't afford or didn't wanna pay the high prices for new PCCs in the early 1950s. So they went on the market for used streetcars and the first batch was purchased from the Cincinnati Street Railway, 52 PCCs purchased in 1950, some of which were only two years old. As many of you probably know, Cincinnati was relatively unique in that it had two uh, trolley wires and, and two, set, uh, two overhead wires um, running in the city. One was removed, of course, when they arrived in Toronto, although you can see the, the trolley, the, the cowling, the, the, where the, the bit on the roof there. Sorry, I forget the technical term. It's wider on these ex-Cincinnati cars than it is in, uh, on the rest of the fleet. So they arrived in Toronto, were regaged repainted and put into service uh, and, and ran in service for many, many years. Here's a Cincinnati Air Electric car. Another Air Electric Cincinnati with quite a, quite a unique front in my view. After that, the TTC purchased 75 PCCs from the Cleveland Transit System, which included 50 Pullman Standard cars and 25 um, cars that were originally ordered by the Louisville Railway Company, and they never ran there. Louisville got rid of its streetcar system before they uh, could enter service, and they traded them to Cleveland for some buses and cash. And the whole PCC fleet was then acquired by the TTC and again brought up to Toronto, regaged, repainted. The blinker doors were quickly replaced by uh, folding doors, as was the, the common practice in Toronto. And again, they entered service uh, shortly after their arrival. They were equipped with multiple unit um, wiring and multiple unit couplers that didn't run like that in Cleveland, but they quickly um, got couplers installed and would run uh, as multiple unit trains for uh, many years, well through the, the mid-1960s. TTC still wasn't finished. A lot of American cities, of course, abandoning their streetcars at this time. And in 1952, the TTC purchased an additional 48 um, Pullman standard um, built cars from Birmingham, Alabama, the Birmingham Electric Company. Um, in addition to the repainting, regaging, and so on, the TTC had to get rid of the blacks and whites entrances, which were common of the Jim Crow South era at that time, and got rid of those before they could enter service uh, in Toronto. At this time, too, in the 1950s and 60s, the TTC ran these different classes of streetcar on different routes. And so these um, ex-Birmingham cars would run a lot on Dundas, and they would run on Long Branch in the very west end of the city. The last order of secondhand PCCs that the TTC acquired were 30 all-electric streetcars from Kansas City, though they were unique. If, if you know your PCC history, you'll know that Kansas City didn't have any standy windows on their all-electric post-war streetcars. 
So they looked a little bit more like an air electric car, especially when they came to Toronto, but they had the all electric uh, controls. They ran primarily on St. Clair. And again, for the people really interested in some of the detail, they had one piece front destination signs um, rather than two. Um, so similar to what you would have had in Pittsburgh, whereas on the other PCC streetcars, you had a route destination sign and uh, like a route sign and a destination sign on these ex Kansas City, they were all uh, just one piece signs. So by um, by 1957, the, 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 the fleet had reached 744 cars, um, 205 of them were used. And they didn't run on the busiest route. Um, the busiest route was the young streetcar line, which ran north south. And young up until it was converted to a subway still operated the Peter Witts with the trailers, uh, about a minute headway, a very, very busy route, um, the main thoroughfare of the city. And these were what were called the original red rockets. One of the nicknames for streetcars in Toronto is red rockets. As you can see, they're all painted red. And these Peter Witts were the original red rockets and the kind of the icon of their day. But the route was so busy that, um, it was decided in the late 1940s to, to build a subway. And so in 1954, Canada's first subway opened about six kilometers, about four miles from Union Station. I showed you a photo of that earlier. And then making a turn left up Young Street and going all the way up Young to Eglinton to one of those later streetcar suburbs that was annexed by the city um, just before World War I. So again, serving the central spine of the city. This is also the year that the Toronto Transportation Commission changes to the Toronto Transit Commission, and it's the year of the regional governance structure in the city. So the old city of Toronto, which you can see in this lighter yellow, is one of now several municipalities that form Metro Toronto, a regional level of government that was also tasked with providing transit. So the TTC now had to provide transit to all these growing suburban areas far beyond the ends of the streetcar lines, of course, areas that were less dense, um, more auto dependent, um, which created a lot of issues and, and tensions throughout the TTC's history. Although the TTC has probably done a better job than any other place in North America in serving these post war suburban areas with high quality frequent transit, um, even to this day. But we'll go back to 1954 when the young subway opens. There were no. Um, TTC looked at a few North American street car, uh, subway manufacturers, but ended up going with the Gloucester Railway and Carriage and Wagon Company from England for the order for the original uh, Young Street subway. And again, that marked the end of the Peter Witt streetcars and, and on Young Street, the last of which ran on the 30th of March 1954 when the subway opened. So a lot of Peter Witts ended up going to scrap. Um, a lot of the trailers ended up going to scrap. A few stayed running, um, especially in rush hour service. Of course, Toronto had a rich history of enthusiast groups and charters, and so there were many Peter Witt charters in the second half of the 1950s and early 1960s. And then the last of the Peter Witt streetcars ran in regular service in 1963. Um, when a new subway extension opened, and we can see that original sort of north-south line becomes a J with the opening of the university subway that hooked that subway back up to the north. Now, this was just phase one of a much larger subway expansion plan, but we're already seeing some details and some, some hints at major streetcar abandonment, because there were several lines that were abandoned, like with the Young Line opening, the Young Subway opening, there were a couple of streetcar lines that were abandoned when the University Subway opened. So we're seeing a trend of streetcar abandonments in Toronto primarily happen when subways are opened. So you're getting an enhancement of transit. Um, and that was certainly a trend that continued for throughout much of the 1960s. Uh, a small fleet of new subway cars were were ordered. Um, these were 75 foot long cars built by the Montreal Locomotive Works, the first subway cars built in Canada and the lar longest um, at that time, I believe, anywhere in the world, certainly in, in, in North America. And they kind of set the standard for Toronto subway uh, dimensions um, up until the most recent fleet acquisition. So with Young Street gone, the busiest streetcar line in the city was the East-West Bloor-Danforth line, which used these multiple unit PCCs interchangeable between different 
um, series of, of PCCs that had multiple unit couplers. So the first one in this view is a TTC purchased um, 4400 series, and then you have an X Cleveland Pullman uh, in behind. This is not frequent service. Apparently, according to the notes on this slide, um, there was a, a car crash of some sort just behind um, where, where John took the photo here, uh, causing a bit of a backup, but very frequent service throughout this uh, throughout this network and throughout throughout the network in, in, in general. Uh, the TTC's slogan at the time, or one of its slogans was always a car in sight, right? You could always see a streetcar, so you never had to wait very long, and the, these lines were were very, very busy. This is where the Bloor Danforth um, streetcar line intersected with the Young Subway. Um, so there was a special little pedestrian area built in the middle of the street with stairs down to the subway concourse. And, you know, this period, sort of in the mid, early to mid-1960s, in, in my view, was sort of the high point of kind of the transit enthusiast streetcar photography era, because you still had a very large and extensive network, very well run, with a, a strong future, with a variety of different PCCs, pre-war air electrics, post-war all electrics, a variety of secondhand cars. And so it made for really interesting photography if, if you know, you're interested in PCCs and, and street cars, combined with, you know, ever more affordable film. Kodachrome is really starting to take off in this point. It's easier to travel between places. And, you know, so many other cities in North America by this point had abandoned their streetcars. And so Toronto became somewhat of a destination, like Johnstown did until 1960, like Pittsburgh did until the mid-60s. Toronto was a destination that attracted uh, enthusiasts from from all across Canada and, and North America to come and, and ride and photograph streetcars. And again, it gives you an impression of, of the city at this time. Toronto was really an industrial city, kind of the second city of Canada behind Montreal. It hadn't yet ascended to the major global metropolis that it, that it is uh, today. So I believe this is a, well, this is a 1947 PCC and a 1965 Barracuda, which I believe did belong to, to John Bromley. I, I, I look through, looking through his collection, there are a number of images of his car also posed beside a, a streetcar. This is at the, the St. Clair Car House, which is now actually a, an arts center and a community center. So the no longer a streetcar barn, but um, the building has been preserved. I suspect the both the streetcar and the car are long since uh, long gone, but um, that building in the background remains. In the mid-1960s, we're also starting to see changes happening in Toronto. And so, you know, this looks like fairly down market retail, and all of this will be swept away within the next decade. And it's kitty corner to the new city hall. That was really the, the first kind of really landmark building uh, of international regard that, that was built in, in the city and um, still has streetcars running in front of it. This is Queen Street, which they're not running at the moment because of subway construction, but um, you can kind of recreate this view today, whereas the one here, there's an office tower and a, and a, a big department store here. Very little in the way of new infrastructure was built in this period. However, one exception was a small section of private right of way in the west end of the city um, that replaced a, a, a line that was running on a, on street trackage that was the street was gone to make way for for a highway. But the big story in the 1960s was continued subway expansion, and in 1966 we uh, we see the the biggest opening of of subway routes in the city's history. Here we see the construction uh, underneath um, uh, underneath Bloor Street, and so this marked a real turning point in in transit and streetcars in the city. And so, in 1966, you can also see the city's population. the The city of Toronto hasn't grown so much. I mean, in, in 1920s it was half a million, now it's 700,000. But the regional population, that Metro Toronto population that I spoke about, is now close to two million people. Right, so you have most of people in the Toronto region not living in that old streetcar city. They're living in those automobile suburbs, largely built after 1945. So the opening of the Bloor Danforth subway in February 1966 um, is a major, major change in the city's transportation, leading, of course, to more or less the closure of the Bloor Danforth line until they added some extensions in 1968 
There were two shuttles at either end that kept going, but the bulk of the line was abandoned in favor of the subway. And a number of other streetcar lines were also abandoned as well, either because they more or less paralleled the subway or because they were just converted to buses because it was just easier to, to do and they were shorter lines, north-south lines that were easier to run with a bus. The Harvard line was, you know, one of the more famous ones in Toronto. It sort of zigged, zigzagged its way from the northwest to downtown to the northeast and twisted and turned around uh, a number of different streets. It was only on Harvard for a very, very short stretch of its, of its um, route. So the busiest streetcar line became Queen, which is two kilometers south of, of Bloor, also an east-west street. And for a number of years, the multiple unit PCCs ran on the, the Queen line. Got to have a snow picture because it's Canada. But for the first time since the early 1920s, the TTC now had a surplus of streetcars. And it got rid of a large number, most of most of its air electric cars in the late 1960s. A lot of them were sold to Alexandria, Egypt, 140 of them in 1968. And so again, there are photos of them, you know, like I just showed you waiting to be loaded onto ships that would take them away. 10 were sold to Tampico, Mexico in the early 1970s. Um, and those that weren't sold were, were scrapped. But at this point in the late 1960s, there was an official plan to abandon all the remaining streetcar lines by the early 1980s. Most would be most would be replaced, um, or one of the big improvements would be a new subway under Queen Street, which never materialized, and it was planned to wind down streetcars over the course of the 1970s. But then something quite remarkable happened. Uh, a group of community activists formed an organization called Streetcars for Toronto in order to lobby the city and the TTC to retain and modernize the streetcars. The group was led by a man named Andrew, Andrew B. Miller, a professor of child psychology from the University of Toronto. Other members included um, Steve Monroe, Mike Filey, and the late John F. Bromley. And the group also had some support from a couple of local uh, city councillors. But rather than protest and organize sort of, you know, vo vocal opposition, they focus their efforts on producing a report highlighting the economic, social, engineering, and planning benefits of retaining streetcars, particularly on busy lines. Not least that it takes fewer people to operate streetcars because they can carry more people than it does people to drive buses. So it tends to be cheaper uh, to, to operate. They released their report called A Brief for the Retention of Streetcar Service in Toronto, three weeks prior to the TTC's board meeting on the 7th of November, 1972. This gave plenty of time for the media to cover the report in great detail. The report was small, only about 18 pages, and it included a short overview of facts that were specifically designed for media engagement. Now, in the intervening three weeks, the topic of streetcars was regular conversation among dinner tables, in the newspaper, and it became a major, you know, a major issue in, in the city. And at that 7th of November meeting, the, vo the board voted unanimously to retain Toronto streetcars. This was just one of several important um, citizen movements in the city at the time. Others included stopping an expressway that would have run down Spadina, uh, a city-wide network of residence associations opposed to the demolition of older neighborhoods, and groups who successfully fought the, for the, against the demolition of City Hall and uh, Union Station. And um, so it sort of ushered in a new era. And then the question is, well, what do you do? Well, a couple of lines were abandoned because they were more peripheral and they didn't, didn't have very high ridership, including Rogers Road in 1974. Then the question is, how do you, um, um, how do you modernize your fleet? Well, the TTC rebuilt 173 of its um, post-war all-electrics that it, it bought new uh, between 1972 and 1974. When they first were brought into service, they had these unique water bumpers installed on the front of them, which distinguished them from the unrebuilt models. And they were expected to extend the life until a new streetcar could be developed and ordered. Another peripheral line, Mount Pleasant, was the last streetcar abandonment in the city in 1976, and it passed by what is still a going concern, although they've moved locations, uh, the, the main um, railway hobby shop in the city, George's Trains. 
Again, the TTC had a surplus of PCCs, and so it sold a number of the secondhand cars um, to uh, cities in the United States, to Philadelphia, San Francisco, and Shaker Heights, and they continued to run some of them into the 1980s in those cities. But the big story was the development of a new streetcar for um, for Toronto, and that was the Canadian Light Rail Vehicle, or CLRV. Six prototypes were ordered from the SIG group in Switzerland, and 190 were purchased from the Urban Transportation Development Corporation um, based out of Thunder Bay uh, in Ontario. A prototype for an, uh, uh, an articulated vehicle emerged in the mid-1980s, and an order for 52 ALRVs, articulated light rail vehicles, was, per was, was placed in the late 1980s. And that meant the end of many of the PCCs. And I can remember as a kid driving out to um, my grandmother's house out in the West End, and we'd go past this St. Clair car house, which would, as it's sometimes known, and it was a storage area for dead PCCs. And there were dozens of them there at the time in the sort of early, mid-1980s, um, awaiting scrap. And that was the fate of most of the, 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 the PCCs in Toronto. There was a push in the late um, 1980s to rebuild a number of them. And I'll get to that story in one moment because in 1997, uh, sorry, in, in, 19, um, in the 1990s, we actually see the first new streetcar growth taking place really since the 1920s. And in 1990, we see the opening of the Harborfront light rail line, um, which was given the number 604, and to run on that route, the TTC decided to rebuild 19 of its, um, the last order of new PCCs that it placed. And they rebuilt them for running on the Harbor Front line. They didn't run for too many years on Harbor Front before being transferred to other routes uh, to serve as rush hour, um, rush hour extras. But a combination of ridership falls in the early 1990s, budget cuts, and a very bad recession in Southern Ontario meant that the TTC had quite a large surplus of streetcars by 1995, and they retired uh, the the remaining uh, PCCs that they had. They kept two for their heritage collection, so their heritage collection is three. It's a Peter Witt and two two of these PCCs, but all the others found homes at various museums and or other trolley <laughs> operators, including some including this one decked out in a Pittsburgh paint scheme, more or less, um, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So these are XTTC streetcars from 1951. In 1997, another major line opened the Spadina line. This is now one of the busiest lines in the city. So they brought out the, the heritage car for the opening. The harbor front and Spadina lines have their own private right of way, which I'll get to in a moment and, and explain how this is quite unique in the city. In 2000, there was a short extension between Spadina and Bathurst on the lake shore to, to connect two north-south lines, only about, what, about six, 700 yards, um, but created a new route, the 509, um, which sort of operated along the lake shore, along the harbor front, and then into Union Station. And again, all private right-of-way. And the, the last sort of extension of the existing streetcar network or the, the original streetcar network was a very short southerly extension of the King Line um, along Cherry Street, which serves a kind of arts and cultural and entertainment district with a lot of new housing going in. Um, and a new loop was put in there. And it's essentially a branch of the, the King Line. So that's a little bit of Toronto streetcars past. And the present is really going to be from about 2015, 2016 onward. And you can see the, <clears throat> the map here today. There is one route up on the north that looks isolated. There is some non-revenue track that goes up Bathurst that connects with that about two kilometers worth of non-revenue track that connects up to the St. Clair line. But you can see quite a dense network of streetcar lines all south of that Bloor Danforth subway. So quite in, in quite a small area of, uh, of the city. So I'll give you a few pictures. I won't talk through every single one of them, but this is a view with a telephoto lens from the top of the CN Tower. And then if we go down and see what it looks like the other direction, there you can see where I took that photo from up in the top.
again, it's Canada, it's cold, it's winter, not, not so much this winter, but uh, this was a, an ice storm that hit, I believe, in 2004 or 2005. I remember photographing with my dad and all the, the, the overhead wires had frozen. Um, so you get this huge queue of streetcars not going anywhere fast. So these CLRVs, these 196, were, were really the, the backbone of the system for the better part of 40 years. And they were like the Peter Witts and like the PCCs before them. They really became the icons of the city. So full disclosure, I have never been inside Fillmore's Hotel. Um, I don't think it's a very salubrious place. Um, I don't know what the hotel is like. There's a gentleman's club inside. It's an interesting place, however, to photograph the streetcars because you always get an interesting sign uh, in front and you get this, you know, quite interesting building and you get the Fillmore sign and whatever sign they happen to be putting up. So this was a number of years ago, probably around 2015, getting ready for the Blue Jays opener. Okay, just we'll come back to this site over time. More typical in Toronto is, is this intense redevelopment. You know, the city is growing rapidly. It, it's growing upward. A lot of redevelopment, especially in many parts of the streetcar city. Not everywhere, but a lot of areas have, have seen a lot of, of change. The other big story in Toronto is that over the last 40, 50, 60 years, it has gone from being a, a predominantly white, going back even further, white and British, but definitely white and European city, to one of the most multicultural cities on earth. Um, somewhere around half the population is foreign born. Um, half is what, what the Canadian census calls visible minority, which is not white. Uh, and you go out into the suburbs around Toronto and, and some of those numbers are even higher. So a very, very multicultural city. Um, and and um, you see that in some ways less and less along the streetcar network, but um, you see a lot of older immigrant reception areas where new immigrants would come into Toronto dotted throughout the streetcar network. Another unfortunate iconic thing or typical thing in Toronto is waiting for a vehicle to turn left. Right, the hundred or so people on that streetcar are just waiting for this big truck to to turn left, and that's very typical of the Toronto streetcar experience even today. Now, most of the downtown subway stations intersect with a streetcar line in one way or another. Sometimes they're quite elaborate stations, and sometimes they're just you get off and you walk downstairs and you're on the subway platform, as is here. And again, you can see this uh, sort of big downtown. Um, this picture is now several years old. That statue has been moved to a park in behind, uh, but you can see the CN Tower, you can see the Art Gallery of Ontario, um, and you can see the uh, Ontario College of Art and Design, which has quite a unique building put on top of their existing building, which again is one of the landmarks of the city. Just for something different, a few images of three streetcars in one shot in various different compositions. This was the site of a former brewery many years ago. Now condo is very typical of, this is along the waterfront, very typical of, of those parts of the city. And when there's not something built, there's generally something planned or under construction. And this photo is now probably from about 2018. So yes, there's something built there now and it looks very much like the thing in the background. At one time, I'm not sure if it's the case now, but at one time there were more construction cranes in, in, in Toronto than, than anywhere else in, in North America. I included this picture for two reasons, not because you get a great view of the streetcar, but you see A, the streetcar, how much it struggles to simply turn out of a loop. This is a, a loop with a subway station in the West End, Dundas, uh, Dundas West Station, but also the, the kind of very lightly used space in the background, which again has all been, um, is, is all being redeveloped into to high rise towers. But it's not all like that. Large parts of the city have really remained frozen in time. Uh, the buildings are the same, the houses are the same, there's very little new housing, and in fact, in a lot of neighborhoods across Toronto, the populations have actually declined substantially since the 1960s. They still look the same, you can look at old pictures from the 60s and, um, and find, know exactly where you are today. 
and so without any new housing being added in in many parts of the city and these are along streetcar lines along the Bloor Danforth subway line um the populations have have declined sometimes by, by as much as a quarter uh compared to the the 1970s so we're coming to the end of the the CLRV era here and um in February 2019 it was kind of their last big winter storm and I happened to be in Toronto and took a few photos as I was coming back from an event of you know the the, the very iconic soon to be relegated to history CLRVs and a typical Canadian winter so from about 2014 15 onward the TTC was introducing new low floor streetcars which I will um talk about in a moment and especially towards the end of the 2010s they were winding down the fleet of CLRVs and ALRVs and so by the spring of 2019 they were only really featured on two routes the 506 Carlton which is an east-west line and the 511 Bathurst now much of the Carlton line runs along Girard spelled differently than your Girard in Philadelphia um but a, a really scenic route and again an, an area where there's been very little change you can see those houses from the 1920s this was originally a Toronto Civic Railway route so part of that annexation in the kind of early 20th century and the person you can see there on the other side of the street with a camera is my father we were walking that line uh back in the spring of 2019 uh taking pictures of uh you know what was soon to be history we are indeed here I guess we can get some coffee there if we if we so chose This area on Gerard Street East has a lot of South Asian businesses, restaurants and food stores and clothing stores. A large public housing, the first big public housing project in Toronto called Regent Park, which is actually um, there's there's two streetcar lines that run right along the edges of it, so it's actually very well connected. Is being has been is being completely redeveloped, so all this old public housing being demolished and sort of mixed income, mixed use housing putting back in a lot more density uh, than what was there before, and that's a, a long project that's been going on for for well over a decade now. So this is where the college, the 506 and the 511 college and, and Bathurst lines intersect. And so this was the last spot in the city where you could actually get two of the two streetcars, two CLRVs on different routes, again, in kind of late 2019. But by um, later in November 2019, there was only one CLRV route left, and that was the 511 Bathurst, the north-south route, not a particularly long route, and a route that I got to know really, really well, because I spent a lot of time in that, in those final weeks and, and even days um, walking up and down the line photographing the, the streetcars and looking for you know the final images of, of them in the city now we've seen this building before might not have clocked it but that's what it looked like about 20 2011 or so it was completely taken apart brick by brick by brick a new sort of bit put on top and then completely reassembled and now there's a grocery store in there it was an old food warehouse and now it's um offices and there's a grocery store and there's a bunch of condos all around it so Bathurst gives it was a, an interesting kind of cross-section of the city you had very gentrified areas you had some higher-end retail but you had some you know lots of new development but also a lot of just ordinary places that kind of hadn't really seen much change happening so it's a fabulous place just to to spend a lot of time and walk around and I'm still not sure what I'll do with these photos. I think there's probably a book in there somewhere down the line. Um, but I just really enjoyed sort of going around the city at, at, at that moment uh, when these streetcars that I grew up with were were about to, to, to be retired from service. So these are all November, December 2019. 
this is right by the subway at Bathurst. So the line intersects with the subway. And this was an old discount grocery store or this discount store called Honest Ed's that was demolished and is now the site of uh, a massive housing redevelopment. So it looks a lot different from this at the moment. You got several towers here, not unlike other parts of the line. This was all former railway yards down by the waterfront. It was redeveloped into a massive condo project about 20 years ago. And the TTC did acknowledge, you know, that the end was coming. And on the 28th of December, 2019, it was the last day of regular revenue service for the CLRVs, ran a number of them on Bathurst. And so, you know, I was joined by a lot of other enthusiasts taking pictures, going out for one last ride. And just, you know, at this point, I had photographed this line so extensively that I just enjoyed riding up and down. My dad and I rode around together for a while. And, um, you know, really just enjoyed this this last moment of, uh, of you know, these streetcars and the, the turning of the chapter in, in, in Toronto's transit history. Stayed out relatively late. There were a number of folks that, that did stay out till the very last ride and, and ran it back into the car house. That was a little late for me with having to drive 100 kilometers all the way back to Kitchener. Um, but I did take a number of night shots again on the very the very last evening of uh, of CLRV service. It wasn't a great evening either. It was kind of drizzling, and you know. And of course, we got to get the the iconic Tim Hortons coffee and donut shop in the in one of the pictures, right? I think we're required as Canadians to 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 include that in any kind of presentation, one way or another. So here we are, back up at Bathurst Station, and. That was largely that for the revenue service. Number of them stayed in um, at one of the car one of the, the car houses and were eventually most of them were sold for scrap. But the next day, 29th of December, there was a farewell parade organized by the TTC. And again, you can see horrible weather, but a lot of people came out to have one final goodbye. And actually, my my son, who was not even two at the time, they were running this the CLRVs on Queen Street just as, as kind of shuttles. And we managed to board the last westbound shuttle streetcar of, of the CLRV. So that was that was uh, good fun. And we came to this loop and then they assembled a number of streetcars, including this one that was was painted up in the final years of of CLRV service as a kind of ode to the to the streetcar. Um, and painted up and and um, then there was a final parade back. And uh, this was my last CLRV photo in Toronto. And it's quite special for me because I'm holding my my one year old in one arm. I got the camera in another. It's raining. The streetcar is turning, and then that was that. Then I think we met the rest of the family and went back home. Um, and that was the end of that era. But you know, it's not the end of the streetcar in Toronto. It's really just a chapter. And the current system is, you know, it has real problems and real challenges. Not all of which have to do with the streetcars, but it carries a lot of people uh, today. So this is just the, the TTC's map of, of the, the rapid transit lines. So again, you can see those streetcar lines are all largely concentrated south of the, the, the east-west subway, which they now call line two. I had to include this shot, right? The guy's going to play shinny hockey. Um, somewhere there's a there's a rink just a couple hundred meters away walking past the streetcar. I had to had to include that. So today there are um nine streetcar routes that uh, carry about uh, 180,000 people a day. And that's one of the busiest uh, light rail, streetcar, trolley systems in, in North America. Now that's down from about a quarter of a million a day back in 2019, pre-pandemic. Uh, and these this image actually is, is pre-pandemic. Some of these are you know a range of pre, during, and post-pandemic. Um, the, the TTC, uh, streetcars are back to about yeah about sixty five ish percent or so of of uh, of the pre pandemic boardings. Again, you get different statistics coming in different places. Uh, the buses have almost fully recovered. The bus network, as I said, they serve a lot of busy areas out in the in the suburbs, um, and it's about seventy five percent for the for the subway. 
four of the five busiest streetcar routes in the city are, or sorry, sorry, four of the five busiest surface routes in the city are streetcars. Oh, we've come back to Fillmore's. There's their slogan. This was somewhere in the middle of the pandemic or their, their sign there. And you can see, actually, this was a pretty down, down and out part of the city, this eastern side of the downtown. But already in sort of 2020, 2021, we're seeing uh, quite a lot of redevelopment taking place. So there's big condo tower going up right across the street from this fairly down market hotel and, and uh, gentlemen's club. So all the streetcar routes in Toronto are numbered in the 500s. I'm not entirely sure why they chose 500s, why they distinguish them from bus routes, which just have regular numbers. Uh, but that, that originated in the, in the early 1980s. So you get your 501, 502, 504, and, and so on. Um, and the current fleet is operated by 204 of these Bombardier Flexity Outlooks, which were all introduced between 2014 and 2019. And there's an additional 60 that are on order. Some pandemic. Sidewalk patios were a big thing here, and they still are going fairly strong. Um, another interesting thing, because again, you've probably alluded that the streetcars are really an iconic part of Toronto, even, you know, not, not just history, but, but today. And so there are dozens of murals across the city. I think my father has photographed every single one of them that have a streetcar in them in one way or another. And here's one in a neighborhood at the end of the 501 Queen line called the beach. It's out along the, along Lake Ontario. And you can clearly see the streetcar in that mural there very prominently. And again, just give you a different impressions of, of some of the places that the streetcars run. Right, this was a former pillow factory in the West End. That's now lofts. If any of you are familiar with the, the sitcom Kim's Convenience, which I think traveled quite well outside Canada, um, it was set in a, a in a convenience store. And the outdoor locations or the outside shots of the of the convenience store were were filmed here at an actual Kim's convenience on Queen Street East. There are a few underground portions of the streetcar network. When the Harbor Front Line opened in 1990, there was a small subway running south from Union Station, essentially down to the waterfront. Then it turned right and then ran along the surface. So there are two underground stations on that portion. And that line was linked up with Spadina in 1997. And at Spadina Station at the north end of the line, it, the route kind of forms an inverted J. At that north end, there's another underground station as well to loop into the subway. Another stop where the St. Clair line in the north, when they built the western leg of the young of the of line one, when it reached St. Clair at it's called St. Clair West Station, they built an underground turning loop for the streetcar to allow easy transfer to the subway. The integration between streetcars and subways is generally pretty good. There are a number of stations. Um, well, there are 16 connections to subway stations in total. Three of them are underground and five others like this one here in Broadview at the in the east end are part of the fair paid area. So there's no need to transfer. I mean, we don't really use paper transfers anymore, but you can just get off the streetcar. You're, you're already in the fare control area. Just walk down the stairs and get on the subway. This is all being rebuilt actually at the moment, this station. So there's a number of diversions. But, you know, if you think of like, if you, take away the buildings and the tall buildings and all that, and you just look at the street, actually very little has changed. And I'm sure you could see pictures of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia where you swap out these low floor cars for, you know, various color if you're Philadelphia or red and cream if you're uh, a Pittsburgh PCCs. And actually the basic things of this network would be quite familiar to people in 1960s Pittsburgh, 1970s Philadelphia, right? There's a lot of street running, there's only three routes that use private right of way, um, or four routes. Sorry, one only uses it for a little bit. Um, three routes are are more or less complete private right of way, and the rest predominantly use on street running. The stops are relatively basic. A lot of them. This is a streetcar stop. Uh, you probably wouldn't notice or wouldn't think that this is a stop that has on a line that has thirty or forty thousand people riding on it every day, um, and you get on and off like you would have done 100 years ago, getting on and off those Peter Wits. Now you can do it with all doors. It's all proof of payment. 
Um, so there are often fare inspectors at the subway loops, right? To check that you haven't just got on the streetcar without paying and then you get off and then you can go into the subway and ride wherever you want for free. Um, but the streetcar system is all proof of payment. And again, I mean, there's still a lot of parked cars on these streets, um, you know, for, for better or worse. The merchants like them because it it means people can park close to their shops, but it does really limit a lot of the speed and the, the reliability of the streetcars. So I'm standing here at a streetcar stop. And in fact, you'll notice that Tesla in that picture has a parking ticket on it. So um, the owner just went in to get a sandwich, if I recall, and then came back, he got the parking ticket and he just sat in his car and ate his sandwich. Um, but the streetcar is just in mixed traffic, you know, coming towards us as fast as the traffic is moving. And then it pulls up and then all the doors open, people get on, people get off. There are signs saying, do not pass open doors. Most of the time that's adhered to. I mean, Toronto drivers know this, but not all the time, right? And, and this is an issue and it doesn't take much for, for something to go wrong, for people to blast past these open doors, which again, happens. Now people get on and off. And again, on a street like this, it's pretty tough if parked cars to, to zoom past all this. So it moves along at a leisurely pace and the doors close and the streetcar pulls away. And that's how Dundas and College and Bathurst and Queen largely operate. When the um, the flexities were intro introduced, they all had trolley poles. And in fact, it took a number of years for the overhead wire to be fully rebuilt for panographs. So as far as I know, somebody might correct me, but as far as I know, it is more or less all panograph operation now. Um, but you can see the overhead has the different, um, different systems for panograph and for a trolley pole. And there were a number of lines, including the busiest line, King, up until relatively recently used trolley poles. Which can get complicated because especially in the downtown core, there is a lot of track. There's a lot of non-revenue track. And again, this would be pretty familiar to 1960s Pittsburgh, I think. A lot of different streets that had track that you could loop around. Very few streetcar routes in Toronto actually loop around the downtown. They run through it. But um, lots of options for short turns and diversions. Everything you see in this picture is non-revenue, right? And that just gives you an impression of, of the, the busyness of it. Sometimes this non-revenue track, like here on York Street, is used for regular, like for a, a long scheduled diversion. They're doing track work, so they just run them on this non-revenue track. Sometimes it's just to get around an accident or to short turn a streetcar. For a number of years, the, the western end of the Queen line was closed. And so these Queen streetcars, this car is turning from Queen South to a street called Dufferin in the West End. And much of this track down Dufferin was uh, was non-revenue for, for a long time. It was just kind of extra track that went to a loop um, where streetcars could turn around for a short turn or a diversion. And um, the King line uses this to a large extent now. And it's also been very handy when track work has meant you have to cut back routes for, for a, a good length of time. Some of this non-revenue track eventually gets paved over. It's not used very much. Uh, this is Adelaide Street. There's two, two one-way streets downtown between King and Queen, Richmond and Adelaide. And the non-revenue the non track there on Adelaide in particular just basically got paved over. However, there is a new subway, a metro that's being constructed that's going to run under Queen Street for a bit. And so they've had to put this track in to facilitate what is going to be many years, four or five years of a diversion around Queen Street in the downtown core because Queen Street is closed for um, for any for everything. So the streetcars, the Queen Streetcars are having to divert. Uh, and when this track is finished, they'll be able to continue along their route rather than having to basically short turn at either end of the downtown. So signs like this are common. And again, it's pretty basic, pretty simple, right? If you didn't read this, you didn't notice it was there, it blew off in the wind, you might not know just with a pole and a piece of paper uh, that there is a diversion. Some people have had fun with this because the diversions over the last few years, I mean, I struggle to keep up. I don't live in Toronto. Uh, so I struggle to keep up with, um, you know, how much is what, what's running and what's not. But um, there's been a lot of diversions over the year, over the last five years or so. And so people have had some fun with, uh, with this and posted these at streetcar stops as well. Another real, I guess this is a real challenge with the streetcar network and having it run quickly is the single points switches um, that again, look very similar to what the TTC would have installed a hundred years ago when they rebuilt all the track. 
Some of them are electrically operated, but some of them are not, where the driver has to come out with the, the, the sort of steel poker thing and, and manually flick the switch, drive around, and then go back and flick it back so the next streetcar can go straight through. And even when intersections are being rebuilt, they're still rebuilding them with single point switches, um, which seems a little bit unfortunate because streetcars go very slowly, especially these big heavy ones, through these switches. And so this can actually really slow down. You know, you've got a, a route like Spadina that has intersections with about five different streets that have streetcar tracks and switches. It really slows down a journey on what should be a pretty fast route. I unfortunately don't have too many pictures of the, the car houses today. This is one of them. Ronson's Vale is in the West End. There are um, three. There's a relatively new one called Leslie in the East End. There's the Russell Car House, which is an older one in the East End. There's this in the West End. And then there's a, a, a maintenance shop um, north of Bathurst Station on that two-kilometer stretch of non-revenue track to link up with St. Clair. There are three grand unions in the in the network where you can turn all ways possible um this is queen and spadina this is about 400 yards south at king and spadina and then this is about 500 yards west of that at king and bathurst and again a lot of these switches are used not all of them are electric where it has na and the arrow pointing above there on the overhead that indicates it's an electric switch but those would only be switches that are used relatively frequently. Just throw in a bus, bustitution, just, just for good measure, because again, so much of the network is, is disrupted with various road construction, subway construction, streetcar track rebuilding, station rebuilding. Now, I mentioned that there are three routes that use private right-of-way, uh, the harbor front route, the Spadina route, which share a good portion of, of their track, and then up in the north end, the St. Clair route. And you would expect, and again, for me, having lived in, in Europe for so many years, you'd expect that this would come with signal priority, and they'd be very quick, and you basically only stop at the stops, and unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. The right-of-way is dedicated, but the signal priority doesn't really exist. And so you get lots of cars trying to turn left, for example, here to get on a highway, and the streetcar just waits, and then you get to the next light, and you got to wait for your, your dedicated signal, but not one that gives you priority, um, unlike, say, the, the light rail that we have here in Waterloo, Kitchener-Waterloo, where I live. And you can see, even with the private right-of-way and their own right-of-way, the the... The floors don't totally align. I don't know what this is like in Pittsburgh. Uh, I believe Philadelphia is looking at completely rebuilding their their trolley network to have, you know, level boarding. But you still don't have that, um, even when the TTC is in full control of the vehicles and the right of way. Boarding on the street, of course, um, you just have to lift your stroller up or lift up, you know, walk up the the step there. The TTC, to its credit, um, was able to get curb cuts installed at every streetcar stop. So they are, in theory, all um, wheelchair accessible. Um, but again, sometimes it is easier said than done, but that's a, a big change that you didn't have with the CLRVs that had steps to get up. So how does that look in reality? Well, we're here at a busy stop at Young and Dundas. So everybody gets in, right? The driver then has to get out of the streetcar. He has to close manually one of the sets of doors and then press a button to activate the ramp that actually has two different settings, one to go down to a platform and one to go down to a street. Then he can open the door, person goes in, and then he can close the door and walk away and everything sort of retracts. But you can imagine how slow this is, having to do this probably multiple times or at least once on, or at least twice, I should say, on, on a run, right? Someone getting on and off. So great that we have this um, fully accessible streetcar network, um, but it it is designed in a way that actually makes things very slow, um, which is a, a kind of typical of the Toronto streetcar network. It's slow. It takes a long time to get around. Um, and there was one huge exception, and that was introduced in 2017, shortly after I returned back to, uh, to Canada. And it was called the King Street um, Transit Pilot. And King Street was the busiest streetcar line in the city. Um, it carried around this time, carried about 65,000 people a day. However, 
in many parts of the city, it was actually faster to walk along King than it was to take the streetcar. They were stuck in traffic. They were unreliable. You could wait 20 minutes and then four show up. And so people compared walking a mile or two to actually taking the streetcar. So what happened in November 2017, the, the city introduced this pilot, which basically forced cars to turn right at every traffic light in the downtown core. So you couldn't use King as a through street. Well, this is as a planning professor, this is like this is like a unicorn. It, it, it shouldn't it doesn't exist. It's quick. It's easy. It's cheap. It's transformative. Ridership went from 64,000 a day to 84,000 a day within the first year of the pilot. That is more than any of the Go Transit regional rail lines. And that was more than entire LRT systems in Houston, Salt Lake City, all six lines in Philadelphia, the Baltimore Metro, the Miami Metro, the Chicago Green Line. This line, this one streetcar line carried more people than any one of those lines. I assume more than the, the Pittsburgh light rail as well. There were also place-making initiatives that were brought in, so they narrowed the street. They didn't really change much of the infrastructure, but they, they narrowed the street. They put in these amenities, right, and um, just some basic signs. And it worked. It worked beautifully until it didn't, until things started deteriorating. Stuff started looking a little tired, right? This was taken last fall, right? Until stuff started getting a little bit broken. But again, this is cosmetic. It really stopped working when it wasn't enforced and drivers just didn't care and drove through intersections. Ever so often, and especially when, when it makes the news, this line, ever so often, there's some enforcement. So anyone who who follows this stuff, whenever they're on King and they see, you know, a police officer pulling someone over for driving through gives a big, a big cheer because, you know, really this stuff should be automated. But um, the enforcement has been very, very patchy. And King intersects with all these other different streets as well. So this is the, the King Street pilot, the King Street Transit Priority Corridor. You can see the sign saying you can't drive through there. Well, this driver has just said, screw that, I'm going to drive through. But the bigger problem here is actually all these cars that are trying to turn right to go on to Spadina. So King and Spadina, another grand union for the streetcars. But they can't turn right on Spadina because Spadina is all clogged. Now the Spadina streetcar has its own right of way, so it can avoid that. But if you can't get through the intersection, you can't turn right. And you can't really get past the streetcar that's waiting to, to go through the intersection. You got to wait. I mean, this was like this series of photos is probably about 10 minutes. Right, this guy gets through. Now we can look down. You can see the next block. There's a streetcar over there. But look at all the cars trying to turn right, and look where they have to go. And there's this is there's a lane that's closed here for construction. So they wait, they wait, and wait, and wait, and finally go through. I think it probably took to go from the first where that was at the light before probably took at least five minutes, if I recall correctly. This all really came to a head um, last, late last year. And it was a combination of the, the, the new subway construction closed Queen Street, other streets were closed, and there was hardly any through routes to get across the city east-west. And it sort of, there was chatter on social media of King Street is all messed up. It's really slow. And there's people stuff on Twitter and so on. And eventually the Toronto Star, our local newspaper, they did a, a, an amazing race, Toronto style. OK, so they went from King and Bathurst to King and Jarvis, which is about 1.6 miles in rush hour. And they had four reporters do this right in the middle of rush hour. OK. Bike took 13 minutes. That's not bad. I mean, it was 13 minutes on the open trail. You probably go a lot quicker, but sure. Rush hour traffic bikes. Yeah. Walk took 27 minutes. Okay, I mean, that's going to be pretty much the same. I think if you can walk it at the same pace, it doesn't matter how busy it is. You're just walking. That seems about right. Car, 60 minutes. Okay. 1.6 miles in 60 minutes. And apparently the, that was just awful. Like the reporter wrote how awful that drive was. But you see the numbers are going up and there is one mode of transport we haven't yet covered, and that is the King Streetcar. And it took 79 minutes. And that was pretty normal um, to, to get through. So what happened? Well, actually, this, this helped to change um, 
some action and the, the city got on having some traffic enforcement officers because they realized it was a few bottlenecks of cars trying to turn, streetcar tried to, couldn't get through an intersection. The lowest point I think in Toronto streetcar history was right at this intersection here on the left um, where a streetcar driver was ticketed by Toronto police for blocking an intersection. Of course, they had nowhere to go, but they had to move forward. If they stayed on the other side of the intersection, they never would have crossed because every other light cycle, more and more vehicles were pouring onto King. So that was kind of the low point. Things have got better since then. I actually went um, shortly after that article was out. I wanted to like live tweet what was going on. And it was the first day they had these enforcement officers and it made a substantial difference. It took only 11 minutes to go one kilometer, which is not amazing, but it's a lot better than it was the previous week. So I wrote an article about that, this and, and what actually we could learn from our light rail system here in, in Kitchener, Waterloo. Oh, we're back to Fillmore's. The condo is complete. The rumors of their closing have been greatly exaggerated. And they say our girls are waiting to see you tonight. All right. Um, so a lot of this, you know, for me is is a combination of hobby and 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 academic interest. And it it culminated really in this book that that my father and I wrote called Streetcars and the Shifting Geographies of Toronto. We made a little trailer here that you can watch. Um in, in the if you sort of scan the QR code there. Um, and in this book, we looked at old images of the city, kind of like we've been doing in this talk, and we we compared them with the same views. We reshot those same views, and we looked at them to understand how the city was changing and why. And, you know, we had a lot of fun putting the book together, and it was a, a really interesting project. We did end up selling a copy to the, the former, now former mayor of, of the city um, at an open house that the TTC had at its Hillcrest shop there. And you can see two of the heritage cars in their collection um there and we had an amazing launch at a, a place called the spacing store which you're ever in toronto you ever up here visiting and you want some streetcar memory streetcar merchandise whether it be a t-shirt or a a toque or anything like that um do do check them out they're a fabulous store and um they have all sorts of amazing toronto things and then academics are not generally not very good at like selling our books and promoting what we, you know, promoting some of the work that we do. But if you are interested in the book, you can scan this QR code and you can buy it from the, uh, the U of T website. So I don't want to take up too much more time. I want to just talk a little bit about the past in terms of the Halton County Radio Railway, which is a streetcar museum that I'm proud to be a, a member of, um, which has some similar history to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. It's located actually between where I am here in Kitchener and, and Toronto. Um, on a former interurban line that ran to a city called Guelph. You see the first two cars in their fleet, numbers one and two there, the 1326, a Toronto Railway Company car, and 55, a Toronto Civic Railway Company car. And the museum has a mile and a quarter of track through the countryside um, with rides, not all year, but uh, through the, the kind of, you know, the warmer months of, of the year. They are very dog friendly, as my own dog will, uh, will, will attest. Uh, the museum has three of the the last series of rebuilt PCCs that um, that the TTC undertook that were retired in 1995. Um, this one, 4600, is operational. One of them is a nice ice cream parlor when you get to the other end of the line. And yeah, it's it's a it's a great museum. So if you are ever up in this part of the world, you want to check out Toronto's transit. Um, do make a trip up to the Halton County Radio Railway. It uh, it's a fabulous little museum and has been going strong since uh, the 1950s. I want to talk just to round off about the future because there is a lot happening here. In fact, there's more subway, light rail, heavy rail, uh, regional rail expansion in Southern Ontario than there is in any other part of North America. And a lot of it is happening very fast and a lot of it is happening very slow. Um, there are three light rail lines in the Toronto region that are now under construction. The longest um, duration of which is line five, which is a crosstown line, which is going to run Two kilometer, four, let's say four kilometers, but two and a half miles north of line two. Um, and it's going to connect with line two at the, the eastern end. These pictures are now a few years old. This line should have been opened a number of years ago, but um, due to some construction issues, has, has been delayed. The vehicles are all there. A lot of the testing has been done. Most of the infrastructure is complete. And in fact, the majority of this line is going to run underground in, in tunnels. 
It's going to be 19 kilometers, 25 stations. It's going to be standard gauge. These new light rail lines are going to be standard, not the TTC gauge. Um, and it's coming with a lot of redevelopment uh, taking place. It's going to use the same kind of Bombardier uh, LRVs, similar to the Flex Cities, but a different model, but the, very similar to uh, basically identical to what we have here in Kitchener-Waterloo. So again, you can pass by the yard and the vehicles are all there. We are hopeful that it might be this September, but they're not giving any kind of announcement date at the moment. But you can see, I mean, this looks more like a metro. Here it emerges from the tunnel. Right, I mean, this in many ways, this probably should have been built as, as a kind of light metro or, or or subway kind of system it's going to have three car trains but i think it's going to be um you know it's it, a lot of it's going to be fully segregated grade separated in the in the tunnel but there's going to be some stretches with uh uh private right of way with with non prioritized signals which i think will be a, a major challenge so in the east end it, it runs along the surface replacing a very busy bus line i talked about earlier some of these suburban bus lines are some of the busiest bus lines in north america and this is going to replace the 34 eglinton east which is a very busy line it will get busier because basically everything you see in this photo all this kind of low-rise retail and strip plazas all has development proposals uh well underway to build a huge cluster of very tall towers 20 30 40 maybe even 50 story towers right here's a mall you know a strip plaza from the 50s very typical of when this neighborhood was built out and this is all going to come down, may well come down since I took this photo, and there's going to be some very tall towers coming in their place. It ends at Kennedy Station, which is now the end of Line 2, where you used to be able to connect to Line 3, which was a very short um, uh, sort of intermediate capacity route, similar to the Detroit People Mover, the Vancouver SkyTrain, that kind of technology. The line was already was scheduled to be closed um late last year but because of a derailment it was closed uh i forget exactly when somewhere in the somewhere in the middle of the year kind of closed and then that's it it's done and um the subway will extend to where this line went um further up to scarborough center which you can see there on the map you can see the i guess if i might this is the crosstown line here Another LRT that's actually been relatively simple to build is the Finch West LRT. It goes through an area called North York. 10 kilometers, 18 st stations was scheduled to open in 2023 and is now expected to open in late 2024. It will use um, Alstom Citadis Sprint LRVs, which are capable of going 60 kilometers an hour uh, with a median right away down the middle of Finch Avenue. And it's expected to carry 40,000 people a day. And it will run actually through some of the poor neighborhoods, uh, some of the poorest neighborhoods in, in the inner suburbs of Toronto. And so there are big changes that are coming. Some will welcome the, the transit connectivity, but a lot of residents are worried about the, the kind of development and whether or not they'll have a future in these, in these neighborhoods as, as apartments like this become much more connected to the, the transportation infrastructure. Where are we going next? Ah, we are going to the west of Toronto. West of Toronto is a, a large city called Mississauga. It was originally sort of a kind of bedroom community suburb of the city, but now it is a, a full-size city in its own right. And there is an 18 kilometer standard gauge, 19 station LRT line connecting um, from a, a GO station, a, a commuter rail, a regional rail station at the southern end all the way up through actually running into a neighboring city to the north called Brampton, um, which is a, another kind of large community outside the city of Toronto. It's actually the ninth largest in, in Canada. Um, so again, you think of like typical suburban landscapes that are now going to have light rail running right down the middle of them. And, you know, these typical houses, you know, you take away that tall condo and this could be kind of any North American suburb. And what we're seeing is, again, we've got a strip plaza here and then coming soon to this location, condominiums at Bristol Station, right? So there's a huge amount of redevelopment taking place, um, even in advance of these lines opening. Um, and Mississauga, you know, 
people often say, well, it's a suburb, but Mississauga as a city is bigger than Seattle. It's bigger than Denver. It's bigger than Washington, D.C. And now likely because San Francisco's population is declining quite rapidly, now likely larger than San Francisco. So we're not talking about a small place. We're talking about a very large, I mean, this skyline would be, um, you know, would not look out of place in most North American cities, right? Um, you get further away from that Mississauga downtown and you get into that sprawling warehouse. We've got an Amazon warehouse that you'll be able to take the light rail to, um, but it will be a very busy line and will continue to bring a lot of development and, and change along that corridor. The big, big project in the city of Toronto, it's not a streetcar or light rail, but I thought I included it as well, is this um, Ontario line, which is going to run it's it, it's a an idea that's decades old, and the idea being that you know you had a lot of people transferring at that Bloor Young station, and if you if you needed some sort of relief line to get people downtown in a different way, and so the origins of this go back forty or fifty years, but it was only um, well within the last five years that this project has has started and moved ahead, and construction started in twenty twenty two. It's expected to open in twenty thirty one. It will feature automated trains. Um, you know, full uh, platform doors and all that kind of thing. The trains will be smaller than the current subways. It'll use overhead wires and a combination of tunnels, railway alignments, and viaducts. And for our purposes, it will connect with nine different, um, nine of its stops will have connections with the streetcar network, including uh, where it starts in the West at the Exhibition, where you can also connect with these GO trains, these regional trains, and the streetcar loop just in behind here. Just thought I'd throw in a, a via train for good measure. So this area is all changing now and you're getting this big interchange station that's gonna be built where you see those platforms in behind a major interchange if you're coming from the West, you'll have a number of different ways to get across Toronto. So it will run through a lot of these streetcar areas that we've seen. So this was taken a couple of years ago, uh, the intersection of Queen and Spadina on the West side of downtown, a grand union for the streetcars and now serious construction for the Ontario line. There'll be a stop here. It'll run right under Queen Street across downtown, hence all the disruption on Queen. Right, this hoarding is for a new station. We're moving now to the East End. It will connect one of the largest sort of post-industrial sites in the downtown core, this former Unilever plant, uh, a big new area called East Harbor, which is gonna have an Ontario line stop, a, a train station, and a ton of other things coming in over the next few decades. And even here, I mean, this is an area in the east end of the city where the buildings are the same as when the Toronto Railway Company built the line out there in the 1890s. Most of those buildings are still around. And right here now, there is going to be a, a major junction with the Ontario line, which will actually benefit people on the Queen streetcar. They can take the streetcar to this stop and then take the Ontario line to get downtown quicker or vice versa. So it will really connect a lot of places uh, together. If you want to buy carpet from this carpet mill, I think you have about three weeks to do so before this building comes down. The line is going to run along this railway alignment and then cut across diagonally across the photo to the bottom right and then go into a tunnel uh, to go up to the northeast of the city. And again, areas like this are going to change dramatically in the in the years ahead, especially along the main thoroughfares. And you're already seeing even before I mean, this line's not going to open until 2031, but you're seeing a lot of development proposals shaping up. Just very briefly, I want to quickly uh, round off here, but I do want to show you some of the regional rail, Go Transit. It is one of the busiest regional or commuter rails in, in North America and is rapidly changing from uh, inbound to the city in the morning to outbound in the city in the uh, outbound from the city in the afternoon towards two-way all day. It's a big bone of contention out here in Kitchener. We don't have that two-way all day yet, um, but some routes are going to see as much as a, a train every 15 minutes. And if you want to go down to the western end of Lake Ontario to Hamilton, Ontario, uh, which is about a, just over an hour ride, you now have an hourly train uh, both ways all throughout the day until until late at night. And Hamilton is also hopefully maybe getting a light rail line. Uh, it's been on again, off again. It's been talked about for decades. Um, it was canceled and then the federal government stepped in with money. And now it's on again, but no construction has started. Um, but you can see Hamilton. Hamilton actually has a lot of similarity to Pittsburgh. It's a steel manufacturing place. You can see on a on a clear day, you can see all the way to D Toronto, about 50 miles, 40, 50 miles away. Uh, two steel plants still in existence, one not make, making not so much steel. 
Um, but you have National Steel Car, which makes railway equipment, and you still have a busy industrial base in the city, although that is also changing and a lot of people are moving to Hamilton because it is much cheaper than, um, than Toronto in the Toronto region. And so the light rail line, if, when, let's hope when it gets built, it is going to run through a lot of different neighborhoods in the city. It is going to connect the university with the downtown and run through, um, you know, a lot of neighborhoods actually that are are right now, you know, struggling with, um, you know, fairly entrenched poverty, which also raises some questions of what's going to happen to the residents and the buildings um, when all of a sudden this 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 new transit comes in. And we've been doing some research in, into that. A lot of buildings have been knocked down already by Metrolinx, a provincial agency that that is building the transit um, to make way for the construction. They'll need to widen some roads and so on. Um, and finally, last but not least, I want to take you here close to home to Kitchener-Waterloo, because I think we have, and I've gone on record in saying this is the best transit line in Ontario, and um, I think it's one of the best in North America. We have a 19-kilometer light rail line that opened in 2019. It uses 15 of these Flexity Freedom LRT uh, LRVs, which will be similar to the Ontario, the Eglinton line in Toronto. Um, and it it's a fairly basic system. It was built, vehicles included, for three quarters of a billion dollars Canadian. And you wouldn't get very much for that today. And it's it's not uh, overbuilt like some light rail systems are. You can see how it fits into the surrounding parts of the city. And one of the things that it has done is it has really catalyzed the growth and investment along this transit corridor. We have a growth boundary in our in our region where you can't build endlessly out into the countryside. And that was done deliberately to encourage, combined with the LRT, to encourage new growth to take place within the existing urban area so we don't continuously sprawl out and out and out. Um, and it, that policy has been very successful. There's been about $5 billion worth of investment along this line, $3 billion of which was made before it even opened. This former skate factory, if you know Bauer Skates, they were made in this building now. There's a restaurant and a grocery store, and you can see the towers springing up in behind. A shoe factory that's been turned into condos. Kitchener, the city in particular, was, was very industrial. The biggest tannery in the British Empire, uh, now an, off, an office for a bunch of tech companies. Uh, Google has a big office in a former tire factory just around the corner here. We're still a fairly suburban uh, region, though, so it runs through these very suburban areas, and it does, in fact, connect one shopping mall in the north with another shopping mall in the south. But in between, it goes through a lot of different places and, and serves a lot of communities and is used by about 20,000 riders a day and will eventually be extended to the city of Cambridge, which is just south of here. And it will use some of the right-of-way of the old Grand River Railway, which was an electric, one of the last electric interurban radio lines in Canada, ran until the mid-1950s, and some of this right-of-way will be reactivated for new electric trains, which is very exciting. Back to Fillmore's one last time. This was taken a couple weeks ago. I was walking around to see some of this development taking place, and okay, there's the sign, but the more interesting sign in front on the side is this development proposal. So the days of that building are probably numbered as um, a new development is likely to take place there in the not too distant future. Very quickly, a bonus. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, I've had the privilege to be working with the archives of, of the late John Bromley. And I'm working on a new book project that will take some of his most important, most interesting images from Toronto. He made 40, more than 40 trips to Europe starting in 1967 to photograph trams. Uh, and of course, Pittsburgh. He photographed the city extensively before the big abandonments in the, the mid to late 1960s. And so I just thought, since this is a Pennsylvania group, um, we'll just end with a few nice images of, uh, of Pittsburgh that I think are probably familiar to a lot of you the fine view line, of course, it's been a real, a real pleasure going through these photos. And, you know, I don't know loads about the city, but I, I know some of the history of the, the streetcars and the, the broader city and, and just sort of comparing to some of these areas today, like here in McKeesport, you know, very, very different and really thinking about like, what is, what is photographed in these images? And it's, it's much more than the streetcars themselves, right? It's much more than just the vehicles. The vehicles are fascinating. I find them all fascinating, but there's so much more to uh, 
to looking at these than just you know these PCCs and and everything else about the cities and the surroundings in which they ran in um, are, uh, are are really fascinating. So I think it's only time for me to take the LRT back home. And uh, I want to thank you all. I think we've gone a little over time, but um, I hope you've all enjoyed this presentation. And I'm happy to stick around and take any questions or field any comments that you have. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share some of this uh, knowledge and, and enthusiasm. And, and um, I hope you've enjoyed the talk very much. Thank you so much, Brian. That was uh, very informative. Uh, lots and lots of questions came in throughout the show. So um, if you want, you can take a minute to scroll through some of those, but I will, uh, I'll pose them to you in just a minute here. Um, and I will give everybody a chance uh, to unmute themselves if they'd like and feel free to turn your videos on um, and just uh, or go ahead and do that now. And before we get to question and answer, I did want to let everybody know um, we do do these trolleyology programs every month or so, and we do have a couple more coming up next month. We'll have um, Cincinnati's incomplete subway. And then um, actually kind of same time period as some of the photos you just saw, April 1971, Pittsburgh streetcar scene and from David Warner. And then um, in June, we'll have a uh, kind of World War II themed presentation and uh, uh, later in June, we'll have, um, inspired by our Twin Cities PCC program earlier this year, the second career of the Twin City PCC cars that went to the New Newark City subway. Um, so thank you uh, again, Brian. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Let me uh, make it so folks can unmute themselves. But in the meantime, um, I'll start with the, the first question that, that popped up. Um, you may have answered this, I can't remember, but do you know if there's any documented reason for the broader gauge uh, in Toronto? I know there's like all sorts of myths about these things. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not sure. I've heard different things as well. Um, there may be people in the in the in the call that know. I mean, I I don't know. Some of it has to do with freight. Some of it has to do with wagon size. But I'm. I'm not sure. I was trying to find some information about that today, actually, just because I sort of <laughs> anticipated that would be a, a question coming from a, a state that has a, an odd uh, track gauge for their right. urban rail. But um, yeah, sorry. I can't <laughs> give you the definitive answer because, again, sometimes hard to separate the, the myth from the, the fact. Sure, you... sure. Um, and then uh, on, I think, one or two of the maps, we saw trolley buses um, on there. Now, uh, were those like streetcar replacements or were they intending to replace the whole system with trolley buses? But then those left in the early 90s, I saw. Uh, what, what's the deal with the trolley buses? <laughs> so there were two <laughs> there were two networks. One was very brief in the 1920s. Um, and it was just basically an extension from the, the streetcar. Um, oh, yeah. OK, so. Come, sorry, I've seen a comment here. I'm going to come back to that question because Sean Marshall has actually confirmed what I thought was also right because I didn't, you know, I was like, I didn't get it fully confirmed. But yeah, so Sean wrote it was a, to allow wag, uh, wagons to fit the inner part of the rails, which mm -hmm. goes back to 1861, which was okay. what my, I didn't want to, you know, go out on the recording and <laughs> say it because I, but yes, Sean, unless we're, I, I can't imagine Sean would be wrong, but um so there's the answer to that question. Sure. So there's a brief um, trolley bus route in the in, in the early 20s, and that was eventually replaced by an extension of the streetcar. The main trolley bus network starts after World War II, and it does replace some of the peripheral streetcar lines. Mm -hmm. um, it does a couple of things. So routes like Weston, which was a radio line, became a streetcar line, uh, and then became a trolley bus line. Um, it also uh, extended routes beyond where the streetcar tracks were. Um, and so, for example, when the Young Subway was opened in 1954, it didn't go as far as the young streetcar did. And so the remaining section was replaced by a trolley bus. And then another line was added that basically formed a U going east and west and then north to connect to some newer areas being built. Okay. Um, so it was never intended to replace streetcars with, with, with trolley buses entirely, although that happened on some routes. Um, and then the system, like a lot of things that kind of suffered from lack of investment and and um, in the late 80s and into the 90s and then that bad recession in the early 90s and the cost of replacing them and and so on it, it just they were abandoned in in 
the early 90s. Um, but at that point, too, there were two separate networks. There was the one in the north end of the city, which had three routes, three or four, four routes, depending on the time. And then there was the main network that was kind of in the western part of the of the uh, of the city um, that that had some north south and some east west routes as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see what else popped up here. Uh, some of the questions people asked were actually answered by other people in the chat. Like, does the TTC offer tours? Uh, and someone said that occasionally there are uh, open doors, uh, Toronto, where where I guess they have uh, some open house type thing. Type thing. Um, do you know of any other like transit related walks or shop tours or charters or uh, things like that? So, so occasionally the TTC will open up some of its facilities. We have a, a big program. I don't know if you have it in the States called Doors Open, um, yes. which is, you know, it's run by the, the city and they have all sorts of different locations that are open uh, on this Doors Open weekend. And what like, like everything has kind of suffered from its own success. It gets so busy. Um, but I've been to a few and I've taken my, my, my kids and, and there's an abandoned station um, when they built that university line, the, there, there was an ability to go both east and west on Bloor Street to connect to this Bloor Danforth subway. And so the two stations on either end had an upper and a lower platform. And at St. George in the west, they're both in use. Bay on the eastern flank, the lower portion only operated for about six months and then it was closed. And so there's this ghost station that uh, a couple years ago, my son and I, we got to go and, and go on a little doors open tour um, so they do that. They have a, a shop as well, like a TTC shop. You can buy some, some memorabilia and, and things like that. Okay. Very nice. Um, and then let's see, we had a question about the CLRVs, uh, that I think was also answered, but about them being saved, uh, any of those being saved for yes. future fan trips or, you know, other uses. Yeah. Again, somebody, somebody who's, you know, able to check on the internet at, at the moment and put it in the chat can probably tell you the details. The TTC has has a, a small collection they've kept. Halton County Radio Railway has a number of them, um, including a couple that are that are operational. And I believe some have now ended up at some American universe or American museums. Mm -hmm. um, that was the that was the plan as well. But the TTC does have some. I guess their heritage fleet is now more than. Um, more than three for a long time it was the one peter witt uh mm -hmm. and two pccs and now it's got a, a small number of of clrvs now i don't i'm not in toronto as often as i used to be obviously but i have not seen one on the streets since yeah. 20, 2019 since i showed you that last picture that i took so i don't know how regularly any of them oh, will get uh, brian it's uh rob, rob Lubinsky here the apparently hey, the there's a i guess the, they're pending installation of pantographs on yeah. the historic cars to operate them on the overhead. So I think right now they can sort of operate around the loop at the Hillcrest shop. Um, and that's about it. So there's two CLRVs. One is one of the Swiss cars that was used on that last day, uh, that last day tour, and one of the Canadian built cars. Uh, and one ALRV that's hiding out at the Roncesville's uh, car house. There we go. There's the answer. <laughs> Someone always going to have the answer on a call like this, right? Absolutely. Uh, and then let's see what else. Uh, we had a question about the the frequency of the cars once they switched to low floors. Um, did that change with the introduction of the low floors? Yeah, because you you essentially had 250 CLRVs and ALRVs, give or take, and 200 low floors. So the frequency has gone down. Um, and the, the the big problem. So one of the beautiful things that I didn't talk about in the in the presentation. One of the beautiful things about this Waterloo light rail is it operates on a 10 minute clock face timetable. And because it has its own right of way, its own signal, we have signal priority here. It sets its, it like it, it runs every 10 minutes. And um, TTC just can't do that, <laughs> right? So they, they run as frequently as, well, I mean, they don't really keep too much of a schedule much of the time. They do get delayed. I think there's a, especially off peak is a base of about 10 minutes now um, seems to be my impression a little more frequently in rush hour, but the idea of like, you know, you don't have to go back that far in, in, in time to when you had CLRV scheduled every three minutes in rush hour. 
uh, on many of these routes. And you certainly don't have that now with, with the low floor cars. That's one of the things where the, the network is, is suffering because when you have this less frequent service, again, it's one of the things like 10 minutes here, I know it's coming every 10 minutes. So I know, for example, it takes eight minutes to walk from my office to the stop. So I know I can leave every, you know, I know every 10 minutes I can leave at the same time and I'll get there and I'll, I won't miss it and it won't leave early. You can't do that with most bus routes and you can't do that with a streetcar route because it's just so unpredictable. So when you cut the service, I would say even when you're running 10 minutes, it's actually a lot less attractive because it's a theoretical 10 minutes, right? If yeah. you, again, you have a couple of instances where cars try and turn left and it's stuck in traffic and you could easily have a, a bigger gap. So the gaps get bigger, the bunches get bigger, but yeah. Hi, this is Andrew Ludassi. I, um, I'm an expat Torontonian, um, and I visited pretty regularly until uh, two years ago. I also went by uh, Kitchener-Waterloo, um, rode the line when it was new. Um, my comment about Kitchener-Waterloo is it's very slow. It may run uh, regularly, and it's on a timetable, but boy, your cars do not go very fast, even on the light, even on the uh, the right of the uh, private right away section. I mean, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 kilometers is the fastest they seem to run. It, yeah, there there are a couple of notoriously slow sections where it, it slows down. It, it makes a number of twists and turns. Um, several sections, it's not, it's not running like 70, 80 kilometers an hour. It's not doing that anywhere. Um, but in a number of sections, it's it's relatively quick, even though the speed of the vehicles isn't isn't that fast but that is one of the few things i think you could critique about it is that you know the running time end to end is is relatively long and there's a couple of sections that do take a long time because it's it's going quite slow in the main sections it's you know it's not too bad and because it has a single priority like you're not going to stop at traffic lights which is a big a big win um you know you have level crossings so you cross a busy intersection on a right of way and there's no traffic light for the for the light rail it just it just goes um but yes, it's it's not the quickest in the world. But again, compare it to some of these, you know, new streetcar lines in the U.S. and it's it's pretty speedy. Yeah. The other question I have is in Toronto, which, as I say, I visited pretty regularly two, three times a year because my parents were living there. Um, when did they start pulling down the overhead on Richmond and Adelaide and removing the tracks in the you know the opposite direction? They were there forever. And then all of a sudden they started to to pull them out. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the exact date. I, I know it's sort of been a slow process until tracks being rebuilt. So again, someone would know the exact date, but you know, there's a few sections that were rebuilt with single track because the two tracks that you get on those one-way streets are a holdover of when they were two-way streets. Right, you know, right. 60, the, 60, 70 years but, ago. But Richmond um, and Adelaide have been one way uh, pretty much in my lifetime. So, yep. <laughs> Yeah, no, they've been one way for, for a long, long time. Um, you know, they rebuilt York, uh, I don't know, within the last, I want to say, 15 years or so. Um, and they, they only put in one track. Um, so but prior, yeah, that sort of deterioration was sort of a, a slow pro process, right? Because the, the track wasn't used. For a, for a lot, um, especially sort of right across the sort of young to, to university stretch. So a lot of construction and pave over a bit and take the wires down for something and open them back up. And yeah. Yeah. Brian, it's Rob, Rob Levinsky here. So yeah, just like to your point to with for a track construction. Yeah. It's probably been over the last like 10 to 12 years, like Richmond street got rebuilt single track um, Adelaide, which is or has re just been rebuilt like in the last six months for that queen street diversion. The second track was just like literally just taken out like four months ago. Um, and Wellington Street, I think, was the last like really, really also really, really old track from like 1972 got taken out in like the last two or three years. So a lot of it's been fairly recent. Um, but of course, with the conversion of the overhead, all the old overhead came down. And, you know, whereas the track is being used, it's being been restrung with the pantograph overhead. So it's actually like fairly recent uh, that a lot of this wrong way track and overhead has come down and, and gone away. Also, are they are they rebuilding the loop into McCall for the what used to be the Kingston line, or it's going to continue to loop on Wellington? Uh, well, the McCall loop is right now being used by the Queen Street cars. So two of the two of those flexity low floor cars got actually fit in that loop, um, and the Kingston Road car is currently running through the downtown on King, 
and the Wellington Loop is being used by the Queen Street car. So to to Brian's point, comments about all the construction, like a lot of all these loops are being used, but not for the things that they used to be used for. There's with all these diversions and reroutings going on. Yeah, it's it's been quite handy to have a lot of this extra track and these different loops and different ways of getting around the downtown or looping before you get right to downtown, but right to the edge. It's it's been quite handy and. As I said, I mean, I for, for me, like the the actual like stuff stuff changes a lot, and when you don't live and ride it on a regular basis, it's um, you know I, I struggle to keep up without all the all the intricate changes of what's open, what's closed, and but there's a lot like I can't remember the last time the network ran as it should. It probably going like I've been back in in Canada since 2017, and I don't think there's been a time since then where it's run like the the way it it would normally run right There's are, they, are they also for... are they going to convert the wires on bay street and church as well to the panograph or have they done that already on bay street there is a section of track on bay between oh yes I mean, the, the idea <laughs> now is every, everything will be panograph <laughs> equipped right yeah. and, and yeah i think i think that's... only the i think only the russell carhouse yard is the only place that poles still have to be used. Otherwise, everything else is panograph friendly. Um, we did have, a, let's see, a hand up from Ed Kohler. Ed, go ahead. Hey, Brian, as someone who's not familiar with Toronto, I appreciated your presentation. It was a great introduction. I got to, I've got to figure out how to get up, get up there into the Halton Radio Railway. Hopefully, Halton Radio has a festival like the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum does. Great presentation. I enjoyed it. And you didn't go over time. Believe me, you didn't go over time. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and I'd also uh, want to thank Kristen for organizing, like I always do, for organizing these things. Because, you know, as producing something on a weekly series, I know the work it takes just to find content to provide. So yeah, I was, uh, lucky that Brian reached out to me. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, if you get desperate, I sent you a few uh, audition tapes. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that's another story. Right. And, and uh, just thank you. Great presentation. I enjoyed it. And uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Much yeah, appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And I see uh, Richard Allman has his hand up. Hi there, Brian. Uh, thanks very much for a terrific presentation. Let me say it's great to see Margaret Bromley here. We correspond regularly, but to be in the same meeting is is fabulous. You really set yourself a very difficult task uh, narrowing down from John's superb collection for one mere book. Uh, it, it, you could fill a shelf with uh, with his treasures. Um, uh, uh, one, one other comment. Uh, part of what happened in Toronto, and this isn't an accusation of you or anyone else, is that there were some very odd political characters along the way in the last few decades. Not that we haven't had them here, but that that was a big contributor. And, and then one final thing, if you'd just comment briefly about the electrification project for Go. Oh, uh, I think there might be people on the call who are involved in that. I know there's, I, I, I don't know what has actually been formally decided with this. Um, there's big expansion coming in terms of frequency. Um, I, I think we'll Make see it more of an S-Bahn type operation. Yeah, so the, the idea is to move towards like a regional rail system where you have this frequent service, you have through running service at Union Station, um, and you can get, you know, 15 minute schedules or, or, or even better. And in fact, we're gonna start to see that um, on a few lines on the Lakeshore line coming up in particular, and even the even the Kitchener line, which is our line, we'll see half an hour service from Brampton into Toronto starting next month. We're not going to see much of the benefit of that out all the way out here, um, but it is it is substantial, and I mean it is this huge untapped resource of these train lines run to you know through places that are really growing, huge populations, and not particularly well served by by rail transit. Um, so it will really connect a lot of places really, really well. So I think it's it's really a, a regional system to watch in the coming years. And it's, from what I understand, there are still some decisions about rolling stock and so on that haven't yet been made. Um, and yes, I, I 
you know, I didn't get into so much of the politics of the of the streetcar um, in the talk. One of the things we actually um, actually I have I have two books in front just if I want any reference. And the one is, the, of course, one of the best books, uh, you know, John Bromley's and, and Jack May's book, 50 Years of Progressive Transit, which I was brushing up on for this talk. And then, you know, our book here, which we do mention, you know, one of the things we talk about at the end is like these different ways of viewing the streetcar. And, you know, on the one hand that, you know, for a lot of folks in Toronto, the streetcar is this beloved icon, right? It's something that you use. It's part of your the identity of the city. It's probably the second most iconic thing in Toronto behind the CN Tower, right? But again, we get into this big region or even this big city, right? There's only about a million people that live in what you would call the streetcar city, right? The, the city built by the streetcar that has a more walkable urban form. It has, you know, that kind of older pre-war feel to it. Um, and another 2 million that live in areas that were primarily designed for the automobile and where getting around by car is still the dominant mode of transportation. And so the other view of the streetcar that we don't talk about, you know, you don't, don't hear so much in, in groups like this, but it's still a, a dominant perspective for a lot of people is your only encounter with a streetcar is seeing the back of one from the windshield of your car stuck in that horrible traffic, trying to get on the highway to get out of the city as quickly as possible. Right. So it is a bit of a love hate relationship. You know, I talk to people from places who have no connection to the streetcar. They just don't understand. It's not something they grew up with. It's something that's an impediment. Right. So, yeah, I, mean, I see a comment here, Mayor Ford, the streetcar hater. And yeah, he didn't like streetcars. He wanted to rip them up. He wanted to put subways in instead. And it, it really gets. He mainly like cocaine. Well, that's another story for another time, I think. Uh, but, you know, it really gets to this, this, you know, this very different way of in experiencing and interpreting the city depending on where you live and how you get around and um for a lot of people even in a place like toronto transit is just not not really considered the, the way to to go especially something like slow like a streetcar right mm -hmm. um i see nicholas has his hand raised nicholas go ahead hey there thanks everyone thank you brian that was an excellent presentation I'm Thank a you. Toronto person myself. Uh, I just want to ask which cities have a streetcar model or trolley model that we should emulate? Like what could we learn from places that are doing it better? Or is Toronto sort of the one that people want to copy going forward? That's uh, that's a very good question. And, you know, as someone who's who's lived abroad for a long time and, you know, the, the easy, the knee jerk rea reaction is everything's better in Europe, right? Um, everything works better in Europe and, and, you know, it, it's it's not the case, uh, but I think there's a lot of things, you know, thinking about the way in which cities like Rotterdam and um, Brussels and Antwerp have taken their, or Zurich, Vienna, you know, have taken their older, what you would call a legacy network and basically upgraded them to modern standards with modern priority, I think is a, a really you know, I think we can learn a lot from what they've done. You know, none of this is rocket science. <laughs> and none of this is we we can't, we need to think of the solutions. A lot of the things, and I talked about this in an op-ed I wrote for the Toronto Star, like with the right priority and the right vision and the right will, a lot of the stuff is pretty simple, right? Like you want your transit to run faster, give it its own lane, give it signal priority, right? Crack down oh. on, on, on infractions of that. Um, and, you know, cities like Rotterdam have turned older mixed traffic tram networks into, you know, modern systems that have, you know, full priority. Um, and they've done it with much smaller spaces than we have here. So I think there's there's examples like that. And I also think, you know, in that article I wrote for the Toronto Star, I talked about Kitchener Waterloo, like to turn into my neighborhood. I can't take the most direct route and just turn left because there's a, a, a light rail track. I have to take a little bit of a detour. It's not much. I don't consider it an inconvenience. But when they built this route here, they had the vision and the determination to say, we're going to give this full priority. We're, we put a lot of left turn lanes in, but sometimes you might have to take a slightly more circuitous route as a car driver to get to where you need to go so that the, the light rail can go smoothly. And so I think that's a really good example that, other places could learn from as well. I mean, I was in Boston back in the fall and it's all 
almost all private right of way there, but it was very, very slow because it generally didn't have much in the way of signal priority. And so you get bunching, you get, you know, waiting at intersections for no apparent reason and all that. So it's not enough just to say, we're going to give it its own lane. You need to actually give good priority to it. And that's also going to be one of the problems with that Eglinton line. When it gets out to the East end, it's not going to have the full signal priority <laughs> that, that it can just sail through intersections like it does here. So if you have a very busy, very frequent service, like there's almost a danger of, is it going to be two lines, right? One that's primarily in the tunnel separated, right? That'll run smoothly. And then you get out to the the outer end in the East and it'll be, it'll be a lot slower and a lot less reliable. Great. Good discussion. Uh, let's see. Uh, Rich, did you have a question? I saw you pop up uh, on the screen there. <laughs> yeah, I was just I was just going to say that, that Zurich is an excellent example. Like Brian was mentioning, I spent I've spent a bunch of time in Zurich, and that's a legacy, you know, traditional trolley system that has been upgraded with signal priority. They don't really have uh, stops at street corners anymore. They're dedicated stations. They have bulb outs, so cars have to move around the streetcar. They're not mixed with the streetcar at the platform boarding areas. I mean, it can be done without a doubt. I mean, I kind of thought for a while there in Toronto, pre pre Mayor Ford era, that you were kind of headed in that direction in Toronto. And there's a little piece of a line that's that runs north and south. Yeah, Ross 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 Vale. Yep, yep. That you can actually see that where they're the, they have the bulb out, you know, station uh, platforms with close to level boarding. And you know you're not you're not just boarding it up walking out from the street corner. So it seemed like you were heading that direction, but then it just got stunted, you know, at some point. So yeah, that was a fairly easy street to do because it wasn't so busy in terms of cars. But yeah, it, it did serve as a bit of a model of what's possible. Um, you know, other places, a, you know, a lot of European cities. I've seen Dresden come up here. Berlin's a good example as well. I don't know so much about Melbourne, but from what I understand, Melbourne has also um changed its its large tram network to 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 give more priority um it will be interesting to see what happens in philadelphia with the the subway service yeah, line. because absolutely. one thing that so what what toronto did and what toronto basically has is 21st century rolling stock <laughs> and overhead now with 19th and early 20th century streets the streets, yeah. apart from those curb cuts and a few spots, like you mentioned, with the um, the small redesigns, the streets really haven't been changed. I mean, so many of those photos I showed them because I wanted to show like, yeah, you could just swap out some buildings and clothing and cars and you have 1960s, you know, Philadelphia and Baltimore and, and, and so on, 1950s Chicago. So what Philadelphia, I understand, is doing is they're also they're, they're rebuilding the infrastructure on those streets. Maybe yeah. taking out some stops so they can run a bit quicker as There'll well. Be a lot fewer stops. Yeah. As well as um as well as um upgrading the 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 rolling stock. And Toronto only did one, right? We didn't do the other the other part. And taking out stops is always a, a, a difficult conversation, right? Because it has to do with accessibility and you know who's using the stops and how far are people walking. Um, I mean, in Europe, it's very common to have stops. I don't know what, sorry, it'll be in kilometers, but you know, four or five, sometimes 600 meters apart. Yeah. And here, you know, the TTC network is still every couple of blocks, basically every 200 meters, 200 yards, whatever that, um, that is, uh, um, you know, still pretty common. And it's been, it's, it's difficult, even though it makes sense for sort of speeding up the journey times, it's difficult to remove stops, right. For, for a number of reasons. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see. Like, I'm hoping to go down to Philadelphia at some point before all that construction starts, and and um, you know, see, see it again before, and then go back once the new rolling stock's there, and once the lines have been upgraded, and just see see what it is. But it has the potential to uh, to kind of be a, a North American leader, I'd say, if done well. Absolutely, you know, Philadelphia's also had that love hate relationship with streetcars where. You know, the city sporadically, you know, supports it, and, you know, hates it at the same time. So, yep. Yeah, I got my uh, Gulf Oil 1970s Corgi uh, PCC model up there. I don't know how 
clearly you can see what's in the background there, but uh, yeah. Great. Uh, do we have other questions or comments for Brian? A comment. Uh, the In the old days, when the streets were dry, there were ruts in the street. And gradually the wagon builders, buggy builders, used the right, the same gauge, if you will, so that it would make a smoother run, less friction. And you can't have one wheel in a rut that may be six inches deep and one on the surface. So when the franchises were awarded, the cities saw a great way to quote, pave, unquote, uh, their streets by using the river, the uh, uh, girder rail and uh, other track. So in Baltimore, uh, next to where I live, I live in Washington, outside of Washington, uh, the wheel gauge was four, uh, five feet, four and a half inches, the widest, turned out to be the widest trolley gauge in the world. Uh, so I, as I was told, the wagon gauge for Toronto was four feet, seven eighths uh, inches, and that was perpetuated in the streetcar gauge. My question to you is, you have this vast amount of track at the wide gauge, uh, why are you going to standard gauge? Uh, it would seem to me that sometime in the future, you might have these systems linked up. Yeah, I, I, it, it's a good question. I mean, these new, these three new lines and the one here in Waterloo, obviously this one's never gonna be linked up with Toronto, hopefully right. extended, but they're, they're building them from scratch. And, and I think there's a lot of good reasons, you know, to just build that standard gauge from scratch. They all have their own maintenance and storage facilities um they may link up eventually but they're also the the load gauge of the um the new light rail lines is also bigger so i think you'd have an issue of um you know taking one of these um you know here ontario or finch lrvs and running them on the downtown urban network um and i think metro Lynx just made the decision that we're going to go standard gauge like the rest of the world and it makes it easier to build Right, because it makes it easier to build those lines, and you just have. I mean, it's not. It's not that it's even two systems. It's like, it's four or five systems that are all separate. Right, the new ones are standard gauge, and the old. I don't like the term legacy system, but the old legacy system of the old streetcar network is just this odd gauge, and and we deal with that. But there are never. There's never been any plans, as far as I know, to. Um, to link up an existing streetcar line with a new light rail line. There might be some extensions of streetcar lines beyond where they are now, but that would be separate from the new light rail lines that are that are being built because they are being built to a different standard. They will have, for example, the level platform boarding. Um, they will have, you know, they might be compatible with each other, but it's a whole new generation. And, you know, th this was also a debate with the Ontario line. And I know speaking with, um, I spoke with a few people about that and, and, you know, the, the default would be, well, let's just build another subway line with the same standard as the subway that was first opened in 1954 with these, and the, sub, the Toronto subway cars are very big. They're long. Um, and they're, they're, you know, the propulsion system is not as rapid as more modern ones. And so a decision was made to say, we're actually going to build a fundamentally new and different line, this Ontario line, it is going to be distinct. It's not going to link up with the other lines. And, you know, rather than building on technology that's now 70 years old, we will start new with the newest technology, the newest standards. So it's it's smaller vehicles, right? It's overhead wire. It is, um, you know, it is automated. It's more frequent, right? Shorter, smaller trains, but more frequent. That tends to be the standard that's approved today or, you know, today rather than just, well, let's just build another subway line. So same applies to this new Metro uh, Ontario line. And what is the difference in total capacity, including standees, between a PCC and, or L or CLRV, if you wish, and the new uh, Red Rockets? The, the, the Bombardier ones. That is something the internet would probably have to... Uh, um, guide us on because i don't have that off the top of my head um 
Yeah, give it a minute in the chat and somebody might be able yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, that's the question. Does does do do 250 uh CLRV stroke ALRVs have more capacity than the 205? I mean, eventually there'll, there'll be another 60. So actually the fleet will grow beyond. So when the, the new six the 60 additional ones all arrive in the coming years, obviously the capacity will be more. I suspect the capacity, I, I suspect capacity is greater on the 205 modern LRVs. Are the, the they're double-ended and double-sided as no, I No, no, they're not. They're single-ended. Single-ended, so okay. Yeah, single-ended. So they opted again, opted. So so one of the things with this, you know, one of the, the benefits of just saying we're going to build these new light rail lines, we're going to start new, is you don't have any of that legacy and that path dependency, right? So the TTC is all single-end, right? There's loops everywhere, which takes up a lot of space, right? And it makes things less flexible because you either need track on streets to loop around, or you need an actual loop rather than just a crossover switch. So, um, um, they're, they're single-ended. As far as I understand, the load gauge is a little bit narrower than the, um, the, than the, the, the similar light rail vehicles for Eglinton and the ones we have out here. Uh, they're both five section, uh, six axle cars, but um, only single ended, only doors on one side. Um, so it's still like, there's never been a, I don't think there was much of a serious discussion of, oh, we're buying a whole new fleet. Let's also, you know, put some crossover switches in and get double ended cars. Cause that's much more, flexible to run right i think it's just been let's continue what we're doing because that's a lot of the streetcar network just continues with that inertia that goes back well at least to 1921 when the ttc started if not going back to toronto railway company days so uh, one last... comment here 75 passengers for each clrv um uh 130 for the for the low floor there's also a comment here, which is which is interesting as, as well, which is, again, something I didn't, you know, there's only so much you can talk about. But yeah, not all the 205 are actually needed. Only 144 of the low floor cars are actually needed in the peak rush hour, and there's 60 more on order. Some of that is due to service cuts. Um, and Rob has pointed out that nine of the additional 60 have been delivered. I think my dad has been on a couple of them, I think. I remember him saying. Uh, I've see, or seen some of them around. Um, so some of that, you know, only needing 144 would be because so much of the network is truncated because of construction and some of it would be because of service cuts. So hopefully at some point the construction is, I mean, it's never going to be finished in Toronto. That's just a Toronto story, but it's, it's to a point where like the routes can run kind of normally and we can get better funding to run more frequent light rail vehicles. Because again, someone in the chat sort of confirmed what, what my thought was of, you know, 10 minute, base service across the day um which is not great when you are some of the busiest transit lines in 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 the country um and you know that was that was a service cut from five six seven minute headways not that long ago and then with the clrvs even even more frequent than that at times so yeah right. well, you know, one I, last question oh one I, last I, question. one last yeah. question if i may uh, I've never seen a picture of the interior. Are the seats facing forward? Is it two and two seating, two and one seating, pedal car seating? On the CLRVs? No, no, on the uh, low floors, the new cars. On the low floors, it's a combination. Um, like you've got you've got the four person seats above the wheels, right? So you've got two seats facing. Oh yeah, each other. yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're not all facing the same direction. They're they're you can easily sit backwards. Uh, in the four person section. And of course, you know, per square foot or whatever, there's there's uh, there's fewer seats, right? Because there's more space, um, um, more space needed for the wheels and other th the, the articulated sections and so on, right? So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the questions. All righty. I think we are going to wrap it up there. Um, if anyone has any questions for Brian, feel free to reach out to me. You should have my email and the confirmation emails you got. 
this evening and I can pass those along. Um, thank you so much, Brian. This was fascinating, great discussion. And uh, for those asking, I fingers crossed we'll have this online within the month. Uh, so you can uh, see all those photos again and, um, and, and share it with your friends. So uh, thank you again, Brian. Thank you to everybody who watched tonight. I hope you can join us again for a future trolleyology. And uh, Brian, when, when that next book comes out, you're invited back for another presentation. <laughs> awesome. And I look forward, hopefully coming down to, uh, to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum in the not too distant future. It's been a while since I visited. And um, so I'm due, due for another visit. See all the great, the great place done to your museum. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you guys and have a wonderful rest of your evening and a happy Easter. Bye-bye. <laughs> and happy Palm Sunday to you too. Yes. Bye-bye. Good night, Christian Goodbye. and Brian. <laughs> come down for the June trolley fair. I'm going to try to make it down. I'm going to try That's my the best. Time. To come down. But yeah. the, the advantages of pirates are also in town that weekend and I love PNC Park. So I can combine a couple of things. So there you go. Excellent. There you go. All right. Good night. Good night, Bye -bye. everybody. <laughs>